What's up my fellow poker enthusiasts, it's Renee aka The Wacko here and together with my co-host Adam Carmichael we present to you the Mechanics of Poker podcast. In this podcast we deconstruct high stakes poker players, figuring out what it is about them, how they think, what they do that makes them so successful with an extra focus on the obstacles they faced and the skills they had to develop to surpass them. Over the years, me and Adam have gained a lot of experience in both reaching high stakes poker ourselves and teaching other players to do the same. We have bundled all this knowledge together in our coaching program, The Mechanics of Poker, which is the most complete poker coaching product on the market. If you want to have a chance to work with me and Adam so you can get unstuck and make more progress in your poker career, go over to mechanicsofpoker.com to apply. But without further ado, let's learn from another high stakes player's journey in today's episode. Welcome to another episode of the Mechanics of Poker podcast. We are very excited to start chatting with today's guest. But before we introduce him, a quick announcement, because we are accepting a small group of players for our Mechanics of Poker 2.0 pre-launch if you want to be part of the pre-launch group go over to mechanicsofpoker.com or click the link down below in the description and add your email to the priority list and maybe we will pick you to join the mechanics of poker pre-launch okay so priority list and we will contact you and maybe you will be part of the pre-launch of the mechanics of poker 2.0 now for today's guests we have a premiere Because we will be talking to a player who only plays with four cards in his hands instead of two. We're going to be talking with Griffith Apollo Jones. He's our guest and he plays between 5k and 40k heads up PLO against the best in the world, including Linus Love. He has been a very fast riser through the stakes, reaching these limits after only four years into his professional career. As always, the road to success did not go in a straight line and he had learned various skills along the way in order to become successful and what those are we will be trying to explore in today's episode as always we are joined by my co-host co-mechanics of poker coach adam adam when i do you four cards instead of two on a scale from one to ten how clueless are you ten i like to ditch two and just start back with two again (laughs) reset the game tree at the base level but yeah, it's going to be very interesting having a PLO player. I know a lot of our audience have been waiting for a PLO player, and hopefully this encourages some more PLO players to come about. But yeah, obviously the poker journey is quite similar among stakes, but also there's going to be some unique obstacles that he's had to face. And yeah, a very quick rise in terms of when he went professional, but he also had a very turbulent time before he went pro, uh, when he kind of dropped out of university or graduated from uni and had some challenges kind of picking up poker and where to go with it. So uh, we're going to dive into his storyline, how he was able to overcome those obstacles and become the high stakes player that he is today. So yeah, very excited for today's guest. All right. Well, before we start, I would like to give a big shout out to GTO Wizard for sponsoring today's podcast. GTO Wizard has made studying poker accessible for everyone and is, in my opinion, one of the best places to go to if you are serious about improving your poker game. Next to having access to all GTO solutions for every spot and having the ability to upload your hands and let Wizard find it for leaks, you get access to weekly coaching webinars in which various coaches, including myself, educate you on the most important spots to start crushing the game. So go over to gtowizard.com slash mechanics to get started and you will get 10% off on your first month. That is gtowizard.com slash mechanics. Now, without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Griffin. Mr. Jones, thank you for coming on the pod. Great to have you. Hi. <laughs> I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to start off the, the conversation uh, at your studies. You studied physics in university, you mentioned, and even though you think it suited your personality well, it did not come extremely easy for you, which is actually unlike most of the players we have had on so far, they usually mention school being very easy for them. Throughout mm. your youth, both in your studies, but also in sports and video games that you've played, did you always have to work hard in order to succeed? 
And if so, did this help prepare you for dealing with adversity in your poker career? Um, there's a few things, I guess. Firstly, I guess in school, I would say um, in general, the subjects that I was good at, I didn't have to work entirely hard at. But if you just look at it as a whole, I would have had to work hard at the subject I wasn't initially, say, inspired to, to learn. Um, so say if it was like um, like for, for more science or maths-based subjects, if I could, if it was the questions based on solving an answer that I could figure out how to do an answer quickly, I would like, I would, I would very much find that maybe not easy, challenging, but also fun to do. And like, I think I would excel at that. But then in other aspects of school where you had to sort of read a lot of books or um, like maybe write essays or something like that, I definitely struggled a lot more with. Um, so, it, so it was maybe more like on the whole of school, like, like I was okay. But for certain stuff that I liked and was good at, like I excelled at, but then for the other stuff, like I didn't really, like I found it hard to motivate myself to, to study certain stuff and then yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it entirely. Um, no, I think I think that's quite common, right? If you if if your natural uh, nat natural curiosity gets and your interest get triggered, your your brain suddenly turns on, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and then in university, like I would say, I struggled with university as a whole, but it was kind of like the same the same um, sort of issue, I guess. So physics, like is physics, but there's a lot of uh, different subjects in the, like different modules in the physics and um, like certain modules that I found enjoyable. I would want to study more and more and more and like I would do okay at, but then the ones that were again, more book learning and stuff, like um, I would also study more. But at the same time, in my first year of university, I did actually fail it because at that time I was playing so much poker. Um, and I almost dropped out. Actually, I packed all my bags up within four months um, and then decided to go back. Like my parents sort of um, like had a talking to me basically. Um, and we're like, what are you doing? Like, what do you mean you want to be a professional poker player? So I ended up going back. I failed that first year and then um, sort of got, my, got myself together, I guess, and then finished then the next three years and, and passed. It's, uh, I think a lot of players can relate who started to play poker when during uni that as every time when you focus on uni poker goes shit and then you focus on poker and then the uni goes shit and it's very hard to to balance yeah. the two I would say right yeah I mean I would say like for me like it obviously wasn't easy enough that I could just like physics especially like it wasn't easy enough like I didn't find university easy enough that I could just play poker all the time and then still pass like, yeah. um, like I still had to work very hard at certain points in university to get through it because like it was, it was hard, like certain topics, like I did find very hard and you couldn't, you couldn't really cut, take shortcuts in certain modules, like the modules where you could figure out, like once you would solve this equation once you could figure out how to do it any way they give you the question. So in effect, you could answer most of the exam after studying very little, if you got the concept of it. But the subjects, mm -hmm. the modules where you had to just learn a lot of, um, like a lot of information basically on on that subject. Like you couldn't really cut the cut the corner, and I did struggle with those ones as well. Like thermodynamics or something was less maths based, less um, derivation based, and more just like learning stuff from a book. And like I didn't really enjoy that. And I guess I also didn't you excel at it either. I guess also like those last three years, it sounds like you were a bit more forced back into school and you were talking about that if you're naturally interested in learning a certain subject, it's easier for you. So I guess also those yeah. three years were a bit more difficult because maybe it was actually poker that you wanted to do, not university. Yeah, I think there's like 50-50 in there. Like, I mean, actually like my, like I did struggle at that time, like uh, the first year, like it was quite hard mentally like dealing with like, oh, should I leave? Or like, like I wasn't so happy either. And um, just trying to balance then poker and like moving out of home for the first time. And then also getting very good at poker and moving up the stakes. 
and then finding success in something, then when physics is not going so well, you kind of get pulled into just playing poker all the time as like an escape almost from everything else. And then when you gain success in that, you're almost like, it almost drags you in further, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whereas then in later years in physics, like, like I actually found enjoyment in certain sub topics and my grades were very, I don't know how you say, like polarized, like in some subjects, some modules I'd get like barely a pass and then some of them I'd get 90% or something. It was, mm -hmm. it was very rarely like or 60 in all of them. Like um, the ones I liked, I did very well at. The ones I didn't really like, I did quite poorly at. Um, so the ones that you could bother showing interest in, those were the ones that you excelled in. Did then these topics that you excelled in, you, you, you did also mention there's a crossover of certain traits that university, this university has taught you that crossed over to poker. You already mentioned mm -hmm. like math, solving certain equations. This seems like it probably has benefited in your poker career as well. Yeah, I mean, like I said, like I'm, I'm not sure like entirely because it's like like what comes first, the chicken or the egg sort of thing. Like mm -hmm. did me being good at poker and that sort of brain thought process make me predisposed to like, like I, I love the quantum mechanics stuff and certain general relativity stuff where like, like it was a lot of deriving equations and mathematics based um, but whether that like helped first or whether the other stuff helped me be good at that, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, that, 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 that makes sense. I also heard you mentioned, uh, you said two words, which was challenge and you, mm. it straight away followed up with fun. So that, that you associate it, like some people who, who face a certain challenge or difficulties, they kind of shy away from it. You know, they mm. might interpret it as, oh, I'm not good at this. I don't want to be confronted with that. But you had... Uh, an interpretation of hey i'm being challenged this is actually fun did you always have that interpretation or was it something that you developed at a, at a later age um i think i always had it but then i think poker was just the unique game and circumstance where like it was complex enough that you could always learn more like we're still learning that right like like you play a hand and you're like oh i don't know what to do there like and you go and like solve it and you you figure out like oh was this good was that bad like 10 years after selling playing or something whereas mm -hmm. a lot of other stuff maybe the ceiling for learning would be a lot lower and maybe also then the competition ceiling would be like harder to get to whereas poker you sort of just log in on your computer and there's like a leveling up system all the way to the high stakes ready for you there and then you can do as much as you want to try and learn the game and figure stuff out so it's kind of like like an almost infinite at that point when you start progression level like um to to get into which which then motivates you to sort of do better and do better and and learn more or something when you started out you you saw like uh, okay because a lot of players when they when they started also that we had on they mentioned oh i thought you know this poker game it's quite easy like i only learned about the depth of strategy that actually goes in later on in my career but you actually now mentioned that straight away from the start you saw a clear sort of leveling system uh you know where you could rise up through the ranks you saw a very big learning curve you notice its complexity is that then what actually drew, drew you to the game um maybe maybe it was yeah i haven't thought entirely on that um but I guess like, sorry, um, like when you log into a poker site or something, like mm -hmm. you have 20 bucks in your account or 50 bucks in your account and you're playing like with bankroll management, you're on like NL4 or something. But then you can see all the games running at NL10, NL25, NL50, all the way up to people sitting with like 5,000 or $10,000. And at the time you're like, whoa, like I could never imagine being one of them. But then when you're playing your one, you're like, and you're gaining success, you're like, oh, like you're looking at the next one up, the next one up, the next one up. And then that kind of drives you to like, like, yeah, make progress, I guess. Or yeah, the me, path, anyway, did. yeah, the path is cl quite clear. Then what do you think is the difference, for example, in people who follow a quote, quote, normal career path? You also see, you know, you have a manager above you who has a manager above him, who mm -hmm. has a boss above him. So you could say it's also sort of clear, but this yeah. is more like the game aspect. That's the difference. Yeah, I think it's also maybe more like self-driven, whereas the other stuff, maybe you have to be good externally, but this maybe is more like if you're good at the strategy and you can implement the game, then you will progress. Whereas the other stuff, maybe there's more, there's actually more chaos involved with like dynamics of people, interactions or something like that. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so in, in a way, we often think that maybe poker has a lot of, like, in a way, you have it's under your control if you're gonna progress, right? Obviously, there is some variance, mm. but if you maybe compare it to real life, yeah, you know, the, your boss has to like you, or you need to know the right people. There's actually quite a lot of variance yeah. in that involved as well if you want to move up through through the ranks. Where I guess poker is more within your control. It's all about you. Mm. Obviously, you're gonna face variance. You're gonna uh, deal with adversity, but as we've seen with many players that we've had on so far, it's more how they deal with the challenges that they face, how they overcome them. Yeah. That's actually going to determine the success. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you also mentioned that you play a lot of sports, video games. This is also not nothing new. Uh, we, we keep on hearing this coming back. Mm. You're naturally exposed to, you liked card games, you liked video games. What was it about poker that triggered more that competitive side of you? Because you did mention, correct me if I'm wrong, that you know you didn't take it as competitive as you take poker now mm. i think maybe i did take it as competitive but maybe in all sports like like i never really specialized in one like okay when i was later teens like like we play rugby in wales and i was never that big in school like i was tiny so it was like the progression for rugby or something we played every day on the yard we loved it like but at the same time the progression is more physically limiting when you're a kid um and then, like, after that, I got into tennis and played a lot. And, um, like, I was okay at it, but never, like, the like the best in the county or something like that. Like, um, I was then curious, like, if you would then play, if you play rugby, play tennis, mm. could you then already compare the competitive drive that you have now, especially because you're, you're a heads-up PLO player? So I imagine that's quite competitive because you're playing against one specific person mainly, right? Mm. You're gonna try, trying to take his money the same level of competitiveness was already inside of you when you played tennis, for example, versus one opponent, did you have the same drive to try to beat them or was it something that really po the game of poker triggered in you? Um, I think like I definitely had the drive, um, but maybe then it was just other limiting factors like skill or something like that. Um, whereas Any poker rugby, maybe just suited me. Physics. Rugby size maybe. Yeah. And also just like enjoyment also. It's like, in a team sport, it's a lot harder to be good, maybe as well. Or not be good, but like it's less. I don't know how to explain it actually. But like, if you're say a small player on the wing, you can't really show you. Like you, you can't really do that much. I guess um, you're kind of just there, like as one of them making the numbers up. Even if you put a lot of time into it, like maybe you need to get big or something. Like, and that's where would be the the way to improve is like going to the gym or something. But when you're still in school, it's kind of like, yeah, not something on your mind so much. Yeah, you again, just so want to play because it's fun. Like, so, so a bit more limiting factors again, outside of your control. Maybe, yeah. Uh, you, you quickly mentioned that, you know, you planned on dropping out one year after university, but your mm. parents said, like many parents did, if their kid tells them, no, I have this poker game, you know, I like, I like to gamble usually their advice is not oh go go at it you know they usually mm -hmm. say no choose a safe option go back to school uh yeah how did you deal with an environment that was not necessarily super supportive with your uh, decision or your motivation to go play poker i mean i would say it was probably down to me that it wasn't supportive because i was very enclosed at that time like i didn't speak to anyone about it and when i came out with it to my parents we hadn't really had a conversation much about like how much I was making at poker or like how much money I had or the decision. It kind of came like quiet, quiet, quiet. And then out of the blue maybe. Um, and they were like, Oh, what's going on basically. Um, and then inadvertently at the end of that first year, my dad actually said to me, like, like, I don't want you to go back to university. If you're going to like, just go as like, and play poker in university. Like I'd rather you do something else. Um, but I, I said to him like, no, I will go back. And like, I want to actually study because I do enjoy physics. Like I did mm -hmm. enjoy, um, and enjoy learning about, about physics, but, um, actually he was the one telling me not to go back then after the first year, because he was like, oh, what's going to change. So then I had to almost prove to myself and them that I could get through it and I could complete it, I guess. Um, but did he, did he say like, okay, you should go pursue this poker thing or did he want you to do something? completely different um i guess we didn't really have that conversation um right but he was like first like oh well i don't think you should go back 
to 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 doing the same thing again. Usually, people get in touch with poker through friends. Was it the same in your case at university? People were playing a poker game. Griffith got invited, started to take their money, um, and it's like, hey, I'm pretty good at this game. It was kind of like that in school, I guess. Like when we were playing in school, like just for dinner money on the. Um, and then everyone else had Facebook. I didn't have Facebook at the time. So mm -hmm. then I downloaded a poker site called PKR. I don't know if you remember, it's the 3D one. Yes, of course. Um, and like inadvertently, it was probably one of the softest sites like ever uh, at that time, sort of 2010, I guess. 20, um, and then I just started playing on there like in the evening and stuff, like, like to try and like get better basically. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, you then, actually you, you, you actually played with the focus on getting better already, not just out of pure um, enjoyment? But just actual enjoyment as well, yeah. But getting better is actually something that you enjoy. So, for example, if you yeah, take the sure. video games, take the sports, and then poker, you are already, you have a bit more of an analytical mind, you would say, that is mm -hmm. constantly trying to look to improve? Yeah, I think that's also why I don't really enjoy playing video games nowadays. Or not that I don't enjoy, that I just don't put any time into, because... I feel like there's a, in, in a lot of them, maybe you have to play it a lot to get very good at it. Whereas then it, for me, it feels like a waste of time if I have to put all that time to get good at a game when I could be putting the time to improving my poker or I could be putting the time into doing something other than being sat on my computer chair, which is not the best like way to spend all your time, I think. Yeah, that, that's kind of the, I, I, I noticed something similar. As soon as I started to play online poker, I kind of stopped playing video games because indeed you already spent so much time uh, behind your computer, right? If you then, for example, go play a video game, I mean, and it's very understandable if you're very good at poker, for example, and you go play this other video game, there's probably a 12-year-old kid uh, <laughs> who's starting yeah. to beat you because he's playing every day. It's not, it's not, yeah. it's not really uh, uh, isn't it nice. Do, would, would you say you have trouble playing sports or games that you're not good at because you know you could be so much better if you would only put the time in it, but you're not going to? Do you find it then harder um, to, to enjoy those things? Actually, for me nowadays, not really. Like, like I'm fine with playing a sport that I'm not good at. I actually enjoy that because there's two types of sort of learning, isn't it? It's like that initial learning curve when you start something new and you get this steep, steep progression. Um, and that's super fun, no matter what, you, what, whatever new thing you try, you see like a lot of improvement very, very quickly. Um, but then to then improve from that, you see like, oh, these people are super good. Um, and then you're like, oh, I know I need to put X amount of hours to get that good. But if you're not like super into it, or if you've already got like a lot of hobbies that take a lot of time, you know, like, oh, I can't gain to that, but you don't like, for me, it doesn't affect me. Like I still enjoy doing something like a little bit if, if I know like, oh, it's just challenging and it's just something new to do, something different to experience. But then also poker or something, or for now, like cycling, like, like I cycle a lot, like maybe 15 to 20 hours a week. And the progression you get then when it becomes like a serious hobby or like a profession is, is that learning curve when you've had the steep bit, you've progressed a long, long time, like you're finding like small increments to get better all the time. Um, so for cycling, maybe you get like a little more, your position gets like a little bit more aerodynamic, like you train in a certain different way. Um, or like poker, you find like these small exploits or small stuff that you've been doing wrong. There's no big leaps anymore, but it's always mm -hmm. like those small increments give you a lot of satisfaction as well. Yeah, so it's that kind of like different thing where like when you become very good at something, the small stuff gives you a lot of satisfaction, but then when you're starting out on something, you also get a lot of enjoyment because it's new. It's like, it's exciting. You can see a lot of improvement very quickly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I remember I struggled a little bit with that. And I think that's also a, a, a part of it. It's also just accepting, for example, I play some Adele, I play some football, I do some climbing, but I do everything a little, you know, once a week, yeah. once a week, this, once a week, that. So I kind of already accepted, like, listen, you know, th this is how good I am. But I still, I cannot yeah. help myself that, that when I play something like, Sh I, I, I'm shit, I want to get better. You know, I, yeah. I need to hire a coach. Yeah. I need to play more. It, 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 but then I'm telling myself, calm down. You're just doing this yeah. for fun, for relaxation. Fun. Yeah. 
Yeah, 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 but I see, yeah. and I see this because I, uh, especially the sport I play with a lot of other poker players as well, and they have exactly that drive. You know, they can't stand losing. They have to improve. They go hire a coach yeah. because they can't stand mm -hmm. being shit. They yeah. cannot just ju just do it for fun. You know. Yeah, I, I'm I'm actually okay with doing that for fun. Like I don't I don't mind losing a, like a random sport that we play. Um, like it is it is like it's down to the time you have to put into it. For the most part, when you're that sort of level, like if you put more time into it, you're going to get better than all your friends. But yeah. is that something that you want to put a lot of time into? Or is it something that you want to just play for fun, enjoy it while you play and then like do your main hobbies then? Um, yeah. as something That's else. kind of also the acceptance part, right? Like, listen, this is just yeah. a hobby. You know, I'm not trying yeah. to be a... Trying to be a professional, professional in this paddle player, or something. yeah, exactly. That's uh, that that's not gonna be uh, my career. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned you started out then playing poker in uni. Did you have an example that you could look up to and be like, hey, these are guys that actually turned this into a profession. They made a lot of money. Did you have someone um, that it's like a sort of career path that you could follow and be like, hey, look, they they can do it, so I can do it as well, or were you just uh, mainly mainly focused on yourself? um at the time like i can't really remember that time but like like i was like on some certain forums like uh poker strategy i guess and then like also subscribe to maybe like blue fire poker mm -hmm. um and then you would see like the players that do very well at that and then there was also quite a few po poker documentaries at the time that sort of like went around i remember that um like dr jiggy or something like this canadian yeah, yeah, yeah. french canadian, the canadian guy. french guy yeah, yeah. um and like like he did videos on blue fire poker and it was just super inspiring like the way he like thought about the game and like was just doing yeah, he, like he was very stuff, creative basically. huh he was very yeah. creative i remember um, and like i i did start off playing no limit a lot as well so um like that sort of stuff was inspiring so i guess maybe from like certain forum posters that i can't remember by now or like certain coaches that would then be like oh i want to get that good um did you did so you actually mentioned you started out playing No Limit Hold'em? Did you start sort of playing professionally or at least semi professionally, you know, next to your university playing No Limit Hold'em? And when did yeah. you get in touch with uh, getting dealt four cards, PLO? Um, I chose to play both at the same time and then kind of like move up with both at the same time. Oh, wow, but that's impressive. For the most part, like I was playing like for the first part, like 75% Hold'em for the first like few, few years. I guess especially back um, then it was way more popular. I mean, it's still, I guess, a more played game, No Limit Hold'em. But yeah. in the past, I guess it was the difference was even bigger. I assume. I think like uh, like I pretty much moved up solely on PKR as well, and mm -hmm. the No Limit games for there were very good. Like they had rim games, and then when I got to fifty cent one dollar, I think then I moved to heads up a lot more as well. Um, All right, Adam, have you ever played? Uh, PLO, or if I do you four cards, you're gonna be like, I have no clue what I'm supposed to do with these four cards in my hand. Yeah, four cards gives me a bit of a panic attack. Two cards is my kind of limit. Um, and yeah, I think I mean you, Rene came around 2011, 2010 sort of time. No limit holding was by far the most popular at that time. I think yeah, over the last five or so years, PLO has become a lot more dominant force. And yeah, I think it's a and no limit holding players have never played it to get a bit scared by the extra complexity and the chaos that PLO provides. Uh, so I want to jump in on your storyline when you graduated university. So uh, so far you've been telling us about mixing poker with uni, which again sounds super difficult for me. I had some friends who played quite a bit of poker at uni and it was very distracting for them. Super hard to uh, not yeah. put too much time into poker and you've got this option to study or make money. And when you're a broke kid at uni and everyone around you is broke, it's very appealing to put extra time into uh, to poker. So then you came out of that, you graduated, you've managed to balance those two well, better than almost anyone I've come to speak with. Then you said you uh, had a bit of a difficult period. So I want to dig into that part of the story where you've graduated from university. What was your mindset with poker and what were sort of your options? So you've got this physics degree. I'm guessing your parents are hoping you go into a graduate scheme and you've got this poker skill set, which is you've managed to keep up through poker. Talk me through what happens as you graduated from uni. Um, actually, like after graduating, I had a, like uh, an idea that I wanted to travel. Um, so, like, I kind of booked some flights to Australia, I guess. Um, and then I had in my head, like, well, I'll just like travel around countries I can play poker from, and then like be a professional poker player while traveling or something as well. 
but then like to brush through those years I would say like I had very very good enjoyment for like the next like two years traveling say but the poker did take a like a big dive I guess um because in those two years I think it was like 2014 2015 2016 even like the game developed a lot um and like by that time like in university say I'd got up to playing like NL 5k and PLO 5k like um not so much on stars but on like the betfair sites and stuff like this um and then in those two years I kind of said to myself like I'll play when I have time and um like I didn't really make too much time for it and then I made even less time for improving it was kind of like Oh, I'll do it like when I have some free time and then when I would play then like like I would try and focus and stuff but honestly like I was playing a strategy that was just outdated and like people were progressing and progressing and like I was out of touch with with the game because I was just traveling and like living my life basically um and then skip forward a few years like like I'd been through like a lot of money from traveling and then also like losing some back and like like um trying to play in games that were then too tough for me. Um, up until the point where then I had to be um, be like looking like, oh, like, do I, do I actually want to be still a professional poker player, you know? Like, um, do I want, like, at the time, like I was making like YouTube videos or something related to cycling. I was into photography, like drone photography and stuff like that. And I had like other interests that kind of took over poker for, for a few years. And poker just took a back seat. But then the problem is when it's your profession that takes a back seat like that, you don't really get to then be good at that profession. Like you like I was maybe never like super good after university to the extent where I could take three years off and still be like better than all the players that then be progressing, like new players have been coming up and stuff. So then at that time, like um one of my friends like recommended like the I think Nandez came out with this PLO lab course or something like um, with Doug, like one of his first ones that it was just before the solver maybe. Um, and then I watched that and went back down to paying like 50 cent $1 and then uh, just sort of ground it back up again, I guess. Um, but that was sort of the turning point where then I took it more seriously and I was like, okay, I have to like get my head down and learn how to play again. Um, and it, it was hard, like, sort of not being in the games that you used to be in. And, um, yeah, like, realizing that you're not that good at it either. Mm. Like, after playing, like, 50K hands, like, 1-2 zoom, PLO, and then, like, losing at three big blinds per 100, which, like, maybe is a normal variance run, but it just felt like, like, I was opening, like, 70% on the button still, like, 80% on the button. Like, I was playing, the, like, a style that worked for me in the past, but, like, mm. Like, I remember speaking to, uh, actually, I was friends with Vanny at the time, like, just online. Um, and he said to me, like, 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 he just said, like, I'm going to three bet the shit out of you. Like, he was a friend, but he was like, like, you can't open this much. Like, like, I'm going to punish you. Like, and he said it almost like out of pity, I think. He was just like, what are you doing, bro? Like, you can't do this. Um, and now we find, like, the open at that stack size that I was playing at that time was like, like, we only open 40% on the button there. And I was opening like 80, 85. I was just like, I can open this, like, fuck, fuck them, basically. But in fact, you can't. Like, um, so yeah, it was it was quite a quite a long process of like changing the strategy basically to 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 get better again. And that, yeah, so at that point, then I was just playing PLO. Yeah. Yeah. So how challenging was that from a mindset perspective? So we've got you built your role, you're playing up to 5k on some of the sites. Then you've gone traveling and your skill sets kind of deteriorate a little bit and the games have kind of mm. moved past you for those levels. And then you've got to come back and almost like reinvent yourself and start from a much lower stake than you've played. I'm guessing from an, like an ego perspective and a mindset perspective, that's quite challenging. And what made you want to start again? Because you're almost having to reinvent yourself from the ground up at this point. Mm. What made you think, all right, I, I want to do this poker thing again, but better rather than just going, right, I did the poker thing and I want to move on to something else. What made you come back to poker and wanted to give it a real good shot? I think... At that time, with that poker lab, there was a clear progression to learn the game very well. This course was superb. Like, um, like it really taught you PLO from a fundamental way to play like six max. 
um, like what hunts to bluff with, what to be track racing in certain lines. It wasn't with the solver yet, but it was just very well put together. Um, and then from that, the progression to learn. And then after that, the solvers just came out, like Manka Solver. And then that just opened up a new world to sort of learn and get better. So it didn't really matter to me that I was playing quite low because like there was then a progression thing again, like similar to before, where then you could learn and you would see everyone making mistakes. So you're like, well, I'm going to improve now with that. So at this point, you've got a clear learner path. You're excited again and you feel like you can yeah, basically go through this course and pick up the fundamentals and you can see where it's going to lead you. Where were you basing yourself at this time? So you've just been traveling. Did you, were you living with the poker players right now or were you just living back at home? Um, actually, at that point, like I think I had come home for a bit. So I was at home for maybe like three, four months when I started then playing again. Um, and then after that, I think I moved to Thailand then that summer or something. And I played a lot at home and then a lot in Thailand then for the next like four or five months, I guess. Mm -hmm. And how long did it take you to uh, rebuild yourself and reinvent your game? So we've got this outdated game that you were currently using and now you're raising from the button 88% and you're having to reinvent from the ground up. How long did it take you to get a winning strategy and start progressing through the stakes again? Um, actually, like for beating 50 cent one, maybe like a month or two. Um, but then like, it was, it was a slow progression, definitely. Like there was certain... Um, stakes that were like very hard and then at that time like i made a very good poker friend like who was um like at a similar level always one actually a bit above me but like sort of he was shotting when i would maybe be shotting that stake in like a month or two so we were playing two five at the same time and then he would move up like a bit before me to five ten so i always had someone to chase and then we were talking a lot of times together um so i think that was definitely a big big part in also the improvement and also like like we were studying all the time together um and then it sort of motivated both of us i think to be like playing a lot and also learning a lot and then also discussing like certain regulars that we were playing a lot with because at the time it was on party poker i guess where they had like a lot of these uh two five leaderboards and five ten leaderboards and stuff like that where like the person who raked the most in a day gets like a thousand dollars or something like um, yeah so like you're playing a lot with the same people so if you have a friend that's also talking about these people as well it's uh it's quite motivating to then to then get good again yeah it sounds like you had someone to chase it's always good when you've got a friend or someone around you who you can have this friendly competition with it's actually really yeah. good to have someone just ahead of you because you can almost see the next step and also you want to catch up it's like having a older brother i've got a brother who's a year older generally a year ahead of me in every sport and every game i was playing so i was like right got to get better to catch up with you so uh, there's this intrinsic motivation to beat your friend as well as the motivation to get better for your own needs as well so uh, yeah it creates a nice environment to learn and get better so this time were you one track minded on poker so before like you've, you've done your traveling pretty much you've got other options yeah. are you all in on poker at this part this point yeah pretty much like like i would still keep up my hobbies and like like meeting friends especially in thailand and stuff like there's quite a good community for cycling here like very good. Uh, I live in Chiang Mai, which is in the north of Thailand. Um, a lot of mountains around, a lot of nature. So we'd always go out riding in the morning. And then I'd come back um, in the like mid morning and then pretty much play like most of the day then until the evening where I'd go out for food with some friends. Um, yeah. So it's it like quite a very, does that sound like a very health conscious guy? Are you you're just saying 15 to 20 hours of cycling? That's not um, a small amount. Have you always been into health and looking after yourself or did poker kind of spark a more professional approach to, to your life? Um, I would say the first year of university was definitely not so healthy. Um, I really but then after that, like maybe like halfway through the first, second year of university, I think like um, we had someone move into our flat that was like a mature student and he had his shit together. And he was like, like he came in and like the first day there, first day in our house, he actually just cleaned everyone's dishes. That was just like a mess in the kitchen. And we're like, oh, then it, it just makes you feel bad because he didn't say anything, he just did it. Like, he's just like, I'm just going to clean this. Um, and then it kind of makes you like, just by example, you're like, oh, he shouldn't be cleaning our shit. Like, and then he's out there doing exercise all the time. And like, he's like clean and like, eating healthy and like has his stuff together so then you're like oh like it was definitely a good 
role model at that time to then get like get healthy, get cycling again, and get studying again as well. Mm. It's very interesting the role like one role model can play. Like this guy cleaning your dishes. I'm guessing he was just doing it for his own kind of hygiene standards in the kitchen. Yeah. But you guys watching him, you're like, wait a second, like we're slobs and he's he's picking up yeah. our our, our job to get a place and yeah it's interesting how like the standards of one person can rub off on others and yeah sounds like you've had good influences around you at the same time at the right time so in terms of poker when you're you're trying to uh, figure out your path right now how much is kind of your overall approach to life fitting into this so you're obviously doing a lot of exercise you're trying to look after yourself how much are you holistically thinking about your your life overall are you how much are you uh, just grinding and studying um i would say like during the two years of covid I was actually planning on moving out here just before COVID started, basically. And I ended up at home, like in Wales, in a small town in Wales. Um, so then, like, I actually lived with my parents for like a year and a half during COVID. Um, and I was very focused on poker at that time. Like, it's when I really sort of progressed the most, probably. Um, again, I had a similar lifestyle where I was cycling a lot in the morning and then playing a lot in the afternoon and in the day. Um, and I guess like maybe since moving here, like I've balanced a bit more of like hanging out with friends and stuff like that. But also the time zone is a bit worse for playing actually here. So sometimes like it's in the middle of the day, there's not really much running. So I'd rather just focus on like like living like living a good life as well here. Uh, rather than being like, oh, like this is the time to work now. Like if someone messages me and wants a game, then yeah, I would like set aside that day straight away. But if there's nothing running or like if I like, like Zoom basically never runs heads up now on PokerStars that I've seen. Uh, whereas last two years, it was like a lot of action in um, heads up Zoom. Whereas that game's pretty much died and the only action you get is sort of with like a specific player maybe. Um, so then that definitely contributed to like a lot less poker hours probably now. Um, yeah. So it sounds like COVID was a time to knuckle down, focus on working. There wasn't any distractions. And that was actually the perfect time frame for you to get better at poker and put a lot of time into it. And then as things have got back to normal, you decided to base yourself in Thailand and live a more balanced life, still playing a lot of poker, but also taking opportunities to see friends, do fun stuff when it happens. And also the games might not be as active at certain times. So yeah, it sounds like you've come to this for very high work ethic part of just grinding and grinding to a more balanced and find out how you want your life to look like. And as you have yeah. more success, you get to uh, to choose those options. Uh, yeah, more, more freedom. So yeah, it sounds like a, a good evolution for yourself. Uh, Rene, for yeah. yourself, have you ever had to reinvent yourself? Uh, so uh, yeah, Griff's talking about reinventing his game after falling behind a few years traveling. If you had to look at your game ever and just go, wait a second, I need a full game re revamp here. Yeah, for sure. I think... Uh... I think I would say most players have had that moment. Uh, I learned a couple of tricks quite early that worked quite well. Uh, and kind of what Griffith also said, at some point the game was just, you know, moving on and I wasn't. And I think it requires like bad results for you to really realize that and to see the necessity of like, I remember I had one bad year where basically only with Rakeback I made something. And I was like, okay, this is not very good. I remember also my bankroll was dropping quite significantly. And yeah, necessity at that moment is just quite high. I think this was also the point that solvers just started to came out. So maybe, actually, I didn't really think about it this way, but maybe my opposition, I was, I think, mainly playing mid six, five and I'll zoom a lot as well. Maybe my opposition started to use a lot of solvers and I was just falling behind. That could definitely be something. Uh, I then moved back to the Netherlands and teamed up with uh, with some other players. And we started to focus more on solvers as well, started to study more opponents, started to, yeah, basically start progressing again from a strategic perspective. I think also the guys that I started to hang out with, we already completed each other very well. One was really good in solvers, or one was really exploitative. One of them really had a uh, like a very big mouth, big dreams that we were going to try to become the best players in the world. And I think it's also very important to have a certain character like that who kind of raises your standards in a way, right? Whereas I was always just like playing poker to live on a monthly basis. I never really thought about trying to become the best. But when he when he kind of put it that belief in the group, like, hey guys, we're going to try to become the best. You start to, yeah, become a bit more resourceful. Like, okay, if I'm trying to become the best, what do I have to do? 
okay, yeah, then we should probably do this, then we should probably do that. And then from there, basically, uh, I think for me, especially from my exploitive perspective, I was already very good, but I just lacked a lot of GTO fundamental knowledge uh, that in that period I gained. And yeah, that really skyrocketed my game because there were things, there were exploits that I thought was I was making, but I was just making that yeah, I was Bad just making case. mistakes. Mm. The, 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 these were no, I had nothing to do with exploits. They were based on assumptions yeah. that were completely wrong. They were just very biased. Uh, so I think now playing from a more theoretical, solid approach, and from there still trying to exploit your opponents, I think that was really a switch in my game that I had to make, and then from there it just went up. Uh, yeah, yeah, and never really. I think back. you still see that a bit now, where it's like some players are like saying. Yeah, they're exploiting, but then they don't really know the baseline is from and stuff like that. But, yeah, I I, yeah. I think uh, I think I often use the example that I would attack guys who would fall to three bats quite a lot and fall to C bats in three bat pots mm -hmm. out of position. But actually, it turns out just due to the the way the uh, the range the ranges are connected, you should actually overfold out of position versus a C bat mm -hmm. in a three bat pot. Whereas I thought, yeah. hey, that's that's a mistake because you know you're not defending enough. So I would be hammering on on stuff, and I would completely ignore the fact that they could actually fold a lot to three bets because there's still four players behind. I could not exploit yeah. that in a ring game, mm -hmm. so I was just exploiting myself. You know, I was yeah. just making making a lot of mistakes like that. And indeed, uh, what Griffith also says, yeah, if you don't know the baseline of what is correct, then how do you know that someone making a wrong deviation? So yeah, there, you you just assumed something was wrong while you didn't even. Yeah, you didn't even know what was right. Yourself. Yeah. So yeah, that, those were definitely uh, there were th 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 that was definitely a period where where I progressed a lot personally. I I'm curious. You were um, mentioning that your game was simply not good enough. Um, mm. That you had to move down. You were trying to rebuild your game. What were some bad habits or leaks that snuck into your game that you think was costing you a lot of money? You already mentioned the button opens of eighty five percent. Do you recall anything else? Yeah. I think like the whole game was just off basically. I was too passive. Like I basically had no turn check raise bluffs or something like that. Um, just even selecting like check raise bluffs on the flop, like with a nut flush blocker or something, so that you had them in your range for when the flush hits on the turn. Like I just didn't have any of this, like, well not nearly to the extent that you should be. Mm -hmm. Like like it was just too weak. Um yeah, pretty much that. But then I was still trying to play like loads and loads of hands in position so it was like i was like in my head like oh i'm opening lots i'm gonna get them to fold they're such nits and but then i was actually my post off play was just super passive then and then it was like like it was just catas catastrophic i guess loose so, passive does not seem like the most winning playing style indeed no no exactly so then you you uh how did you then go around improving how did that how did that process look like you you mentioned you teamed up with a buddy you mentioned that yeah. you found the the course from jay nandas any mm -hmm. any specific aha moments that you had from that course or from study sessions with your buddies where you're like oh wow i mean from that course yeah like some of the bluffs that he was just implementing even pre-solver just like he thought about it like what needs to be in the range um and at that time that was enough to be like aha in a lot of spots and i was like oh this can be in that range this can be in that range pre-solver but then yeah with the friend i think like i definitely relate to what you said about like like when you're with with a few people that like you're motivated to learn and then you also then have like somewhere to aim for so like you said like oh we want to be the best like even if maybe you don't reach it it's like there's that goal where you're like you see these people playing at 5k or 10k or wherever and like you're like oh they're making mistakes here or like I think I can get there and I, I want to get there to try and like battle them or something. Um, and, and then maybe if you're not even thinking that high up, it's just like the next stake above you. Oh, these players are playing that stake, but there's like five different other players that we haven't played against. And then you get there and you realize like, oh, it's Cobus or something. And like, then he's doing a lot of stuff like very different to the players that you're against. Cause he's like a sick mid stake player um, mm -hmm. at the time. And like, like, He's doing stuff very, very differently. And then you're like, you try and work out him then, and you try and work out like a different player. And then there's always something engaging and then also motivating to try and then outwork them or something to, to then beat them. Is that still something that uh, that drives you up until today? Like the that, that you get inspired by 
uh, by great players you see playing or that maybe that give you a, a small beating, you're like, hmm, nice. Because also remember in school, you, you match the two words challenge. It's fun. Is that still something yeah. that, that, that triggers you? Definitely. Like, and I, I do find a lot more enjoyment in heads up than six marks. Like, like I've always played both, like even the last few years, like, like I moved back up playing six marks. Um, and then maybe in the last two years shifted mostly to heads up, but mm -hmm. um, now playing a lot more six match just because of the action, say on GG, that's where you have to play. And there's very big games there. They're, they're actually huge. Like they're too big for me. Like yesterday there was a 500 one K game. Um, so there's like, then again, that progression. The only problem is with GG, there's basically no reg battling. Like the rake is just insanely high. Um, and it's just a pity because then like you kind of have to wait around then for a good game. Like um, I, I have not been on there that long, but like you hear stuff like, oh, you need like a good PVI or something. I don't even know how to work it out. Like, like if there's a game, like I'll play it most of the time, but sometimes I'm not even sure like, on that site, like how good it would be. Um, mm -hmm. But at least there's some progression there where you're like, like, oh, there's this, this high stake, but I would find by now, like the players that you see for the most part, the players I really respected the last two years, mostly are not playing so more. Um, so then the, the, the guys at the top now are kind of like the ones that have a lot of money that have built a role, but not, might not necessarily be that good. Which is good foresight, right? It is good also. But then it's also like, um, I don't know. Like, I think some of the enjoyment was always like seeing like, like some of the best players like um, playing and then seeing what they're doing and being like, oh, like, how is he doing this? Like, what's he doing there? Um, whereas when it's just like, like a punter reg, just like taking money from a whale at a higher stake, you're like, yeah, you want to play in it, but you're just like a bit like, oh, like, like it's yes. not so, it's not so challenging then. You're like, okay, like you want to make more money so that you can play it, but then it's not like, oh, this person is really doing something interesting. Oh, he's put a lot of work into this strategy. And I think there are some players that are obviously doing that. And like, like, like there, there are them there, but then maybe they're not the ones in that game all the time either. So basically... I, th I think a lot of players would hear you say, and they're like, wait, this makes no sense. You said that you're a bit sad that there's only will games and that there's no rec games. <laughs> and I think a lot of players would, would, would think about it the opposite. And you also mentioned challenge. So you don't really see mm -hmm. a challenge in terms of accumulating most money or exploiting a will to the best of your capabilities, for example. That's not something that's challenging for you. You are more intrigued by uh, competition, that play like a high level, maybe a uh, solver approved type of strategy and you're trying to outbeat their strategy. That's something that way more drives you. Is that also the reason then why heads up maybe triggers you more than ring games? Because it's a bit maybe. more like a competition between your strategy versus my strategy. Let's see who's the best. Somewhat like that. Like, and definitely in the past, like in certain ring games, like when I was moving up on stars, like I got battered at three hand on. 5k like i think i'm down a lot still lifetime like um from like 2019 time trying to break into 5k um because i would just play three-handed with like gravy and action free or something and like at the time like i thought i was doing stuff well but then looking back like i was probably making like two passive mistakes again or something like that um but i just wanted to fight like 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 not because i thought i was better because i didn't know like obviously i thought like oh like like I'm playing okay, but then you also just want to challenge yourself against the people who are like at the top. And you're like, well, even if I don't succeed, maybe I'll learn and get better from that and then be able to succeed better in the future. Whereas if you're kind of like, for me, if I don't play, I don't study that much. Like I have to kind of put in the hands to then like go through them and see what I did wrong. Whereas like, like just say now, if there's not much heads up to action, I won't go through like hands from like six months ago and study that much. Like, like it's fun just to play like Linus like a bit and then like like even if it's a small session then like figure out like oh like go through all these hands basically and then learn from that like it's it's more fun to 
to play and then learn from it rather than just sort of sitting there studying, I think. I was actually planning on saving this topic for, for a little bit later, okay. but I think the audience will will get angry if I don't follow up after you mentioned that you were playing against Linus. Uh, you you also mentioned that you have to people message you for games. And from what I understood in the heads up environment, it's a bit more, the games are a bit more arranged. You also mentioned uh, playing Linus. Is it then Linus texting you, hey, Griffith, you up for a game? How does that work? Pretty much. Like Linus is always up for a game, I think. Um, but then not many other people really ask for one, I guess. Um, but I think nowadays, like I said, the, the games are somewhat dead on. So was, Linus, like for all purposes, was just playing to practice against me. Um, I think he had lots of bigger games, like bigger stakes, but he just wanted, like, he's also someone that I think loves the game, loves to, like, create chaos in the game and just try out stuff. So, like, he would just always want to play. Like, he's just, like, bored, basically. Like, I just want to play. Like, I want to learn stuff. I want to, like, that's that's how it felt from my end that, that he wanted. Um, from my point of view, like, it's kind of similar. Like, I wasn't sure that I was better than him. Um, I'm not sure that I am. I'm like, I mean, he beat me like the last few sessions we played quite badly. So like, yeah, maybe he's doing some stuff that, that I didn't really think of, but like it on that, that sort of topic, like I was quite disappointed in some of the other PLO regs that no one really played him. Like, like he kind of just started asking for games, I guess. And like, for the most part, he just didn't really get any action. And it was kind of like a bit like a, like, where are the guys like to 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 take on these no limit guys? Um, because like maybe his name just like made it that people wouldn't want to play him straight away. Whereas like you at least want to try. Like maybe he is really really good, but like don't you want to see if he is? Don't you want to see like how he's playing to like I don't know. Like you might learn something as well. But there wasn't really that many people that that actually played him. Um, I think now he like he has some games like somewhere else maybe, but on the whole part like yeah, because I can imagine if someone comes from a completely different background in this case, uh, no limit hold'em. He also played obviously a lot of heads up ring games. I guess you could learn something from how he approaches spot differently. Obviously, certain situations you'll be like, okay, this is clearly a mistake, but other situations he might do something that's because he thinks he comes from a different game and he might think have a different approach on it, you might actually learn something. Is there is there something that you're like, hey, this is actually quite interesting thing that he's doing. Uh, I might I might I might take uh, I might add that to my own game. Has there been moments like that? Um, for sure. Like sometimes, like I mean, his strategy is very chaotic. So, like sometimes I don't know what he's doing. Like if he knows what he's doing or if he's just trying to be as chaotic as he can in the game tree to like get us both out of like out of book in a sense and just be like like just embrace the chaos um mm -hmm. but i i don't know and maybe he's just practicing stuff maybe he's got like a read against me that he wants to do it this way um i don't know but it's fun it's challenging like you never sit down and you're like you're bored like it's super engaging normally i can only play for like an hour or something because it's like like it's intense you know like he's attacking every spot that you're playing. Like he's making you think like every bit of the game tree, like, oh, am I balanced in this spot? Like, is he just going after this bet size? Like more than maybe other players would do. So in certain spots, it feels like he's a lot worse than maybe other regs, but then in certain spots, it's like, you're not sure if you're just getting taken to the cleaners basically. Yeah, and we, we talked about this a little bit off stream as well, that it's, that, that it's a bit more difficult. Let's say you have someone who you know or has maybe less of a reputation as Linus and does shit that you are like, okay, this is probably not very good. You have quite a big confidence in that read of it not being good. Whereas if in this case, uh, Linus or another very good player does something that you intuitively say, oh, this is, can't really be good. But then again, mm -hmm. you know, you do give a certain amount of respect to a very good player. Uh, how, sure. how how is that different in terms of dealing with a situation like that, and also in terms of losing versus a player who uh, who has a big reputation or who you know is very good in PLO compared to someone who you're very confident that you're beating? Yeah, I mean, like you can post the graph that I sent you if you want, but like we played like a, quite a few K hands, I guess, and like it was in general like quite a close match, I think, and then like 
Like I think I was up maybe five or six pints and then I lost like 20 within 1K hands. And um, like, like I said, like I went through the hands and I think I played sort of okay in the big pots, but then you're still evaluating it. Like, like it's hard to then, I don't know, like continue from that because you in your head, you're like, like, is he just like completely exploiting me in certain other spots that like the self-doubt definitely creeps in a bit. So you want to take some time to like compose yourself before playing them again. Um, especially when it's someone like Linus, whereas if it was say a different player, maybe you'd be like, oh no, like a bit more confident in your, your play. Um, and how do you go about, yeah. you, you said like you have to compose yourself before playing, playing again. How does that process look? So from now until you play Linus again, what, what are you doing to make sure that you're ready? Yeah. I mean, we played a little bit last week, like for an hour or so, but yeah, I guess it's just like, like, I, I guess I didn't study that much during the month, but I just made sure I was in a good headspace if I was going to play him and be like, okay, like now I'm going to focus. And like, after playing him, I'm going to look at the hands and study them and then like progress from that again and like reevaluate basically like, oh, was that just variance a month ago or was he playing very well and destroying me? I think it's a very important skill for players in terms of sort of protecting your own confidence, both towards the high side and the low side. Estimating variance, is that something that uh, that you naturally think you're good at? So you stay um, in, in line so you don't have too big of a confidence swing. So you realize that if you do very well, that you know there's a very, very big part that it's just positive variance and same yeah. towards the it, other it side. It is tough because like definitely if like, I have the same graph against someone I'm like I'm not stopping to play them like if it goes the other way or something but there's definitely something in the head where like it's hard to make good decisions when you lose a lot very quickly for me anyway like like I try and implement my strategy but just taking a step away for a few weeks to then make sure you're not like holding on to this like oh uh, this feeling of just getting battered and battered and battered because like say if he's bluffing like a huge amount all the time but then he just shows you the nuts 10 times in a row. Psychologically, then it's harder to click call, even though you should like, like you want to implement the strategy, but then you're like, oh, is he not bluffing enough against me or like this or that? Because you're just getting shown a very small sample size. So you need to maybe like take a week or so to just be like, okay, back to what, what we know. Um, and do you then also and try to maybe, head. maybe battle, maybe kick the ass of someone else in the meanwhile, you know, to get, get gain some I mean, confidence if regain someone else some confidence. wants to play if someone else wants to play then yeah um, yeah because that's very interesting in, in 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 when i used to play a lot of three and four handed you kind of have sort of the same problem i remember for example linus was always up to playing but if linus plays <laughs> i was out you know that's that's yeah. just my my general rule for making money in poker uh mm. but in heads up it's probably like that as well as soon as someone invites you to a match it's probably going to be close or the guy is very delusional, but you both think you can beat each other. That's what I find very interesting about heads up. Uh, no one is going to join you knowing that he's clearly the worst player. So how mm. it's, it's, you, you need to be dependent on people being a bit too delusional. I think to like, this is what I respect. Action. This is what I respect a lot about the no limit guys. Like quite a lot of them are moving over to heads up, uh, PLO or like PLO ring games. And They've got a lot more fight in them than the PLO guys, it seems like. Like, they're always battling on stars. They're battling somewhere else. Like, like they're just throwing it down three-handed, whereas that hasn't really happened for a long time on stars, um, like in PLO. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe there's a few players that would throw it down, but no one actually wants to play with them. Um, and they've sort of stopped playing because of that. Um, like uh, I'm so good or something. Like I haven't seen him online much recently, but like, like he was pretty much the best heads up player, like really, really well executing strategy, but no one would really play him. I think Linus played him a bit. Um, maybe Linus would still like to play him. Um, but then like, like for the whole, for the most part then it's like, sorry, I just need to regain my thought. Um, like, yeah, the no limit guys will just like fight and they'll work out later if they're, better than them or not and say like the ones that are moving over like make make by finn um or like philly smiles or like stefan maybe like they'll throw it down with like a plo guy and like 
like they're not thinking so much that they better they're just trying to like execute some sort of strategy and like like they're just practicing and they're just like i think they've had a lot more experience in battling they know how it goes a bit like maybe that's their progression to learn the game it's just by playing and seeing what the guys are doing and then they're okay with losing sometimes and winning sometimes because they know the swings involved in battling free-handed whereas like even me like losing 20 by straight versus linus was just like it was hard like there's not so many red battles that like I've had this year where I've like lost 20 fines or something. So it's like the no limit guys moving over, I think are a bit more like predisposed to that general poker sort of swings and variants and just fight. And they're, they're used to fighting. Like, like you say, like these three handed games, the no limit ones are always the ones that are getting posted on, um, on two plus two forums and stuff like that. There's very rarely PLO ones. Um, anymore so there's just and, like, less they're, battling they're, they're starting on. over they're starting over and playing PLO and they're the ones battling like even pass or something mm. like mm -hmm. uh, pass 72 like like they just come over and fight they don't think like oh am I better than this person am I worse like they just okay they'll play the worst player if they can but like they don't they don't care so much like or who it is they're just like they just test themselves you know and they go mm -hmm. from that and I respect that, like it's, it's cool. Hi guys, it's Rene aka The Wacko here with a little Mechanics of Poker 2.0 announcement because we will be giving the opportunity to a small group of players to get early access to the Mechanics of Poker 2.0 update. And if you want to be part of that group, you need to go over to mechanicsofpoker.com or click the link down in the description and add your information to the priority list. This way you can have a chance to be one of the first players enrolled in our Mechanics of Poker 2.0 program. In our program you will get access to 80 plus hours of content in which we will explain you all aspects needed in order to become a more successful poker player. Now one of these of course is the technical aspect of the game in which I'll be explaining you all the mechanics behind poker strategies. We'll be talking about GTO, exploitive play with an extra focus on the why behind certain strategies and why the population has certain leaks. And to increase your win rate even further, we've recently added a river bluff and bluff catching section so you can increase your EV when those pots become very big. Our mindset and performance coach Adam Carmichael, he took care of the mental game and performance section of this program in which he will teach you everything you need to know in order to break through limiting beliefs, better handle your emotions, break free from tilt and play your A game more consistently. And last but not least, we've added the management and optimization section in the program in which we will give you various tips and tricks to make it more likely for your poker career to succeed and how to continuously improve as a poker player. Now on top of that, this concept is continuously evolving based on feedback and suggestions we get from our community. Next to all this content, you will have access to our exclusive Discord community, monthly live Q&A calls, and one-on-one -on -one coaching session in which we are going to be reviewing if you have been implementing the stuff that we teach you in the mechanics of poker correctly. So do you think you have what it takes to master the mechanics of poker? Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com, add your details to the priority list and maybe you will get a chance to work with me and Adam and make more progress in your poker career. But for now, without further ado, let's get back into more goodness in today's episode. You mentioned a lot of players transitioning over from No Limit Hold'em to PLO. What in your opinion, not necessarily these players in specifically, but what do you think are some common mistakes No Limit Hold'em players make when transitioning to PLO? Mm, I'm not sure. Um, I think maybe like certain stuff they do maybe like with a combo that like, I don't know how to explain it. Maybe, maybe like PLO players are more used to like executing a strategy based on every single component in the hand. Whereas the no limit guys, like they generally, I see like all their strategy is balanced, like their frequency in a lot of spots are very balanced, but the hands that go into the certain spots are not the right ones. Whereas PLO ones could be a lot more imbalanced, but the hands are normally like make more sense going into each spot. Does that make sense? 
Mm-hmm. So like like a certain no limit player might always find like the ten percent check raise versus the latest C bet or something, but they're not using the right hands. Um, but they're finding the frequency very often. Yeah. So I, f- I think you mentioned as well that in PLO because you have more cards to your disposal, removing, blocking becomes a bigger part of the game. Whereas in No Limit Hold'em, there's a bit more randomizing going on with certain combos. Whereas the yeah. randomizing here is being taken over by the fact that you have more information in terms of cards removal and blocking. Yeah. So sometimes we might see like a certain combo that they use that like would then make us think like, oh, they're doing this way too often. Whereas maybe they've just randomized that combo. Whereas if it were maybe a PLO player, they wouldn't have randomized it. They'd have just pure folded it, but then chosen a different hand. So in a sense, the frequency would be the same, but the hand selection would be different, maybe. But I can imagine that uh, even in PLO, there's probably going to be spots where your suits are just, you have so many good uh, uh, blocker, unblocker properties in a certain line that you cannot use them all. I assume those spots do exist and same vice versa. Sure. Like the problem with uh, with this purely playing, playing on your hand in No Limit Hold'em is there's going to be spots where you will have way too many good candidates and way too few good candidates and that will lead to massively mm-hmm. underbluffing and overbluffing certain spots. Yeah. Uh, I assume that still applies to PLO as well. So there is some randomizing in the situations where that's really the case. Sure. Um, and like certain spots like it is pretty much a mix in the solver anyway. So like maybe you would, um, or maybe you just like, like see what the play is doing and then just decide based on that. But it obviously depends who you play them. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And in terms of you, you mentioned, you know, the heads up environment, there's maybe not a lot of action. So you have also been switching to playing more ring games. Uh, what were some things you had to work on in terms of transitioning from heads up to ring? Um, I would say like, I didn't stop entirely playing ring. Like I was playing both of them, I guess, um, to fill the action. So I'd still wait at ring games to, to try and get action when I was playing heads up. But the, I think the main thing is like the, the game tree is just so complex in six max is, it's very, very hard. Like, um, which is good. Because like, like it's a complex game, um, and like the studying process is a lot harder. Because like the game is like it depends so much on like the raid size, um, or like the stack size of everyone, and then if it gets like three handed or something, like it's very hard to then study and then find out what's right. So you need like definitely an extra, extra bit of intuition, I think, to be very good at six months PLO comparatively like in certain spots it's like okay like it's very tight and like the range is a bit more compressed but uh, then it gets to a certain point where it just becomes like pure chaos as well um where like there's an extra player in or the stack sizes are a bit different to what you're used to and like you're in quite an unknown spot um and then maybe there's more because the ranges are more compressed, maybe there's more exploits that you can make in six months in certain spots as well. Like, um, like I know a f- certain few players that do like very, very well at six months, and they would say maybe they don't play very GTO at all. Um, yeah, because I guess there's more pr- more players involved, and like you said, the game tree is harder. So if the game tree is harder, probably are people are further away from GTO. So exploitative lines will, if if you know where people are further off. Uh, of GTO, yeah. you exploitative lines will probably make you more money. And I guess also the big difference is uh, the recreational at the table, uh, kind of the disturbing the equilibrium, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And you see like certain players will go after the recreational player uh, way, 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 way more exploitatively than some of the other players. Um, so it's kind of interesting seeing like a lot of different styles in six max PLO sort of how they react to certain dynamics in the game. Um, for me, I just don't find it quite as enjoyable as heads up, but there's definitely certain stuff in there that's like super interesting, I guess, if you if you wanted to get into it. Is 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 it also harder because the I guess if you play Rec Wars PLO heads up, trying to find the correct answer, or the correct answer is a bit more within your 
reach, whereas in ring games where there is so much chaos, there is just no correct answer? Is it then also sort of the mental side that it's harder to accept the fact that we just don't know and you're just winging it? Yeah, I think there's a lot more winging it involved. Um, and maybe you like you don't know, but you're pretty sure like, oh, this is good or this is not good. Like in certain spots, you should just be like folding range versus someone that's not bluffing enough mm -hmm. um, or something like that. Um, Whereas maybe you'd have less of that in the headset. Um, yeah, because I guess if you significantly, because in heads up, you have to make the money from the, your direct opponent. Whereas in six mm -hmm. max, for example, I can play uh, a bad strategy versus the best or try to avoid, for example, the best player at the table and give away some EV, but still be very profitable at that game because I'm maximizing versus the weaker players and losing the minimum versus the better players. So there's a completely different dynamic going on in terms of where your money has to come from. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Also, I think from a, a mental game perspective, how do you find losing and winning a different experience if it's in ring games versus heads up? I think like heads up hits you sometimes a bit differently because uh, you can just, I mean, in both of them actually, you, you can just get smashed. Um, but maybe heads up, it feels like a bit more personal when you're like, like if you're playing versus one player and they're smashing you, you're like, oh, okay. Like maybe I should stop because they're better. Or maybe I should like take a break or something. Whereas in six marks, if like there's a big whale at the table, you still want to carry on playing, but then maybe there's like a certain player that's doing something that's really exploiting you at the same time that you kind of have to be like, okay with. Like you're like, oh, okay, I'm losing in this spot, but it's worth it to like play with the whale or something. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 th I think I think it makes a lot of sense. Hmm. Yeah, go on. Um, but like, I do have a lot more experience losing at six max. I think like my edge is a lot less at six max comparatively. And then um, like downswings can last for a lot longer. So like if your edge is less, maybe then it's harder to evaluate like if you're playing a good strategy or not, because like the variance takes a, like the, the standard deviation and stuff is lower, but the, the, the edge is a lot lower for me anyway. So in certain spots when maybe I was playing in games that I thought maybe I was beating, especially sort of the reg battles, maybe I was just steadily losing. Mm -hmm. um, but then evaluating that is quite hard sometimes as well. Going forward in terms of uh, playing these ring games, maybe more in the future, what do you think is something that you should focus on improving from um, your perspective? I think it's just like, for the most part, like I would just improve by studying, I guess, like certain spots that come up often and then, um, then going from there, I guess. But it is kind of hard because, say, if it's on GG, um, like a lot of the games are quite a unique spot all the time. So you have to be very disciplined to then study the spots that are quite unique because they don't come up often then. You're like, oh, well, you throw it away. You're like, oh, this isn't going to happen again. But then you, you kind of rob yourself of actually learning because you're just like, oh, like this is just a random game that's going to happen once this is just a random game that's going to happen once instead of actually like uh, keeping the same discipline as you would in your other game to then learn and figure out stuff better. Whereas like I have one friend that will like, he'll clip 20 hands from the session and he'll be like making this custom sim for each spot and like, like figuring it out basically. Um, mm -hmm. And like he was doing this for the last two years and now he's, really really progressed this year at six months so it's like like i would say he was that skill two years ago but this progression of just always being super dedicated in in like trying to figure stuff out in six months and now he'll watch me play sometimes and he'll be like oh like you're completely off in this spot and i'm like oh shit like but previously maybe he looked up to me at six max and been like oh you're very good but now he's almost like oh he's like overtaken that stage at six months for sure. And how does that 
then change because you you mentioned in general in the PLO environment people play more when they're when they have a certain level of certainty that they can beat you right it's a bit a bit less just winging it like the no limit holding players going into a six max game knowing that you might be off in certain spots how do you think you deal with that knowledge the fact that you're not as skilled in six max as in ring games uh, does it affect um, your yeah your your confidence going into a game I think it's just like disrespect to some of the other players like that you're just like oh they're not playing very well either so like I trust myself to be better than them but knowing myself that I'm making a lot of mistakes as well and there's a lot of improvement to be had um yeah I think that whereas yeah, maybe in the past like in some of the tougher games that we played like it was more like uh let me just try and think about it yeah, I think maybe in the past, maybe it was more out of a challenge, whereas now, like, okay, the skill might be, like, we know we're making a lot of mistakes, but then you also know everyone else is making a lot of mistakes, and maybe they've put less time into it than you. So you still hold a certain level of confidence, but you realize, like, there's a lot of improvement to be made, but these people are also just in the game because there's a big whale there. So you're kind of like, you'll put yourself into it. And then you kind of have to be then um, dedicated after the fact to then try and learn from that rather than being like mm -hmm. doing it again and again and again, because it's easy to then put off something that like, like I said, like uh, the spots get quite unique. Maybe there's a whale at the table, the stack size configuration is weird, but after enough repetitions, like you just gain knowledge about the spot and about the game in certain dynamics that then will help you further on. But maybe the you don't get the the satisfaction of getting that spot again soon. Mm -hmm. Risen heads up, maybe it will come up next week or something. Yeah, and that does change. Obviously, the frequency of spots and how often things occur will change the the way you study it. Right, ring games a bit more holistic view, and whereas in heads up, you can go very specific. Um, sure. I was wondering. Let's say, for example you mm -hmm. would be handed a low to mid stakes PLO player. What would be like, and, and you would, you would coach him in three sessions. What would be like the topics you would pick in, in the first three coaching sessions in your point, in your opinion, the most important things that this player would have to learn in order to progress and maybe get, get unstuck from low and mid stakes. This uh, can be heads up or ring game, whatever you feel, uh, or you think the first three, three coaching sessions can be, just PLO in general mistakes that they should avoid both heads up and ring game. Yeah. I think like it would probably depend a lot on the player. Um, mm -hmm. And then maybe like I have coached a little bit in the past and like, yeah, I would just watch them play. And then like, I think it depends maybe where they come from. The mistakes I've seen players make can be quite varied depending on who it is. So like mm -hmm. one player does certain stuff very well. One person does other stuff very well. Um, I don't know what like mid six players are doing that differently. I think they're just doing everything a little bit worse, but some of them are probably executing very good strategies nowadays, but maybe the games aren't there for them to progress or something. So I, I'm not sure I can answer it that well, but I would say like the most frequent spots, like the, 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 like the big blind versus small blind single race pot, like three best spots, small blind versus button. Like if you nail these, you're just going to be in a, better way to like a better spot to implement the rest of the game tree because like you're nailing the most simple spots or well, not the most simple but the most frequent so basically if you would go to someone you would grab the most frequent spot start with that and work your sure. way to the most unfrequent spot that's what you're saying yeah for sure yeah um and then maybe like go from hand to hand to figure out then like oh like like um you would you wouldn't need to see too many hands to then like figure out what the person is doing and maybe you would like quiz them in a certain spot, like in this check race spot, like using some quizzing software or something like that, like, uh, and see like the general mistakes they're making in like this spot. Um, because you can spot it quite quickly, I think. Um, yeah. And also like what you mentioned, right. You want, you want to hear how they think about a certain spot so you can kind of spot the flaw in their decision-making. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and like, like, like I said earlier, like when I was not really, like when I took a long time from the game, like 
there were certain spots where I was just at like a zero frequency line for this sort of check raising type spot. And like I've coached people who are playing up to 5k and like they're sort of at that zero frequency spot for like some check raises or like some of this or some of that. And it's like, it's kind of mind blowing that they can be at that level, but then it's like also you do get away with stuff in, in PLO. And yeah. Because they do yeah, need the frequent spots, I guess. Sure. Sure. Um, which reconfirms your, and your, then maybe your coaching like, strategy. Maybe, maybe you can get away with being a reg, like missing these spots, because that's the difference between like three to 10, but they can still win at three big lines per hundred because there's a very bad player there. So it's like, they don't have to worry so much about this other spot. But for me and then some of my friends that are into poker, like we want to nail that spot as well. Because um, it is fun to, to, play, to play better, right? Not just be like, oh, there's a whale in the game. I'm maybe winning at three big blinds per hundred. I think this says this really says something about what drives you in poker. Uh, that you're way more, it's way more about the game and the challenge than necessarily the okay, well, my game is good enough. I make money because I'm playing first this will. I'm just here to 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 make my hourly and then I leave and go on with my life. You're really yeah, intrigued by the game, so to speak, and progressing in it. The challenge, remember the word fun linked to the word challenge. That's kind of what keeps on driving you. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Adam, you played a lot of uh, heads up throughout your career as well. Does it sound familiar that at some point, maybe the people who want to give you action are not necessarily the guys you want to play with and the guys who you want to play with don't want to give you action? Very true, very true. You often get hunted by the guys who are slightly better than you and the guys you're trying to hunt want to avoid you. So in the heads up sitting goal world, it was quite polarizing in terms of what you were doing you were either established at a level and you'd bum hunt the fish or you'll try to shot take the level above and you played pretty much 100 regs so you had parts of your career where you're just battling 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 and other parts where it's just playing recreationals and it's all fun and games and in those moments when you're playing the, the shot take the higher level very often it's the top two or three guys at that level who are always available always want to play and they want to play long sessions it's the guys who are a bit weak at that level who play 30 minutes here, 40 minutes there. So you're chasing after them and getting basically chased by the other guys. So it's a bit of an interesting dynamic. And I'm sure it's quite common across formats where the more established players and the best players want to play anyone. The other players are kind of ducking and diving. But yeah, it's definitely, I relate it to what, um, what Griff was saying about Pogger being a bit more of a personal thing. Their story heads up being more personal. There's something about sitting down across from one player, even if it's an online name, where it's just you versus him. There's something a bit primal about it. Either he's beating you or you're beating him. There's no scapegoat. There's no, maybe guys are break even, but there's like, there's going to be a loser and a winner of a sample size. And you're going directly at their strategy and they're going directly at your strategy. And one of you is going to come out on top of that integrate battle. And it does feel quite personal. And if you lose over a period of time during that, you're like, wait a second, am I delusional? Is this guy getting me in spots that I haven't figured out? Or is it just variance? So there's this dynamic, like you're talking about that lightness battle uh, in terms of, is it just variance? Is it just part of the game tree? He's attacking you when you're not sure of. And it creates this dynamic of self-doubt, but also uh, you want to get to the bottom of it and kind of beat that player. So yeah, I think Heads Up has a unique dynamic like that. I'm sure there's other formats that have components of that, but it definitely gets uh, magnified in the Heads Up environments. Uh, so one thing I wanted to ask you, so you starting out in your career in Wales and traveling the world with your kind of poker role, and you've, you've had a, a career path in terms of when you got that Jane Anders course, you had a, a path of where you wanted to go, how to learn poker. I'm guessing you were, were quite an ambitious guy who wanted to progress to higher levels. Is there anything that poker has taught you throughout your career or brought you to your life that you didn't expect? Um, that I didn't expect? Um, mm. I'm not sure that it's taught me anything that I didn't expect because like I've done it for so long, I guess. I'm not sure what I would expect, like what I expected it from, like what I expected from it. Um, but I think it definitely like taught me like, um, like, like most poker players will say, just like a very sort of, like for me, I'm quite calm. Like if something bad happens, it doesn't affect me too much, um, especially in general life. Like, and like when you see other people maybe getting affected by like certain circumstances and like be it something that you can control or can't control like 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 yeah it would make me a bit annoyed or something but like I feel like I can deal with it quite well now um and like I don't stress out about it or like um like I don't like get mad at it or something like like you can kind of like pick it apart and then 
like figure out how you're going to deal with it like when it happens and then then carry on without it affecting your life too much whereas you definitely see some other people because like like okay my general life now i'm not hanging out with poker players in daily life and like something will happen that then really puts them off for the day and you're like oh like like you feel a bit uncomfortable sometimes saying like don't think too much about it but like like because you want to empathize with your friend or something and like be like oh this this sucks and like it does suck maybe but but then there's also a way to like progress from that and you don't need to well in it or something um but that's a very good one yeah, that's know. a very good one yeah almost almost putting things into perspective focusing on things that you control rather than things you don't control and when bad events happen putting that into the context of okay it's a bad events let's move on from it or yeah, put it into kind of perspective that's healthy for you. And yeah, it is interesting when you uh, look at non-poker players and it is, as, as a poker player, we often, we often think like very logically, very analytically. We can often be very uh, matter of fact about situations and a lot of people will freak out when things go out of their control and adversity strikes, like such as COVID or any dynamics which create a cr extreme negative in their environment. It's very easy for a lot of people to freak out. Obviously, poker players aren't robots. We still have our ups and downs, but generally, most poker players develop a skill set of going, okay, that's variance, that's a bad scenario. How can I move past it? And what do I control in this situation? So uh, even for yourself, when you talk about COVID in that period of time, you couldn't go out and see people like, most in the world, but you controlled your work time and you basically played a lot more poker, a lot more grinding, a lot more studying. So you took a negative scenario and actually progressed through the stakes and made a, mm. a generally bad scenario into something good because that's what you control. So uh, yeah, I think it's that having that context of being able to uh, uh, focus on what you, yeah, what you can control in those situations. I think the thing for myself that poker taught me was if you work hard towards something, you can keep progressing with it. I think myself, like at mm. school, I was similar to you. I was good at some things when I was engaged, generally sports and maths, other things I was really bad at. Uh, but even the things I was good at, I didn't really cap out. I always got to a, a good level, but not great. I did a lot of middle distance running. I was always like good, but not like really good. And I had this kind of mindset where talent prevails and it, you can only go as far as your talent uh, pushes you. But then poker taught me something different. It was like, actually, almost like the play, playing field's level. Obviously, there's talent like people who get into poker who have a head start. But generally, if you put the work into it, poker rewards you over and over, and you can keep progressing and keep progressing. And there's no limits. There's no, uh, obviously, there will be some geniuses who are pretty hard to beat in poker. But generally, like, you can yeah. progress and keep progressing with work ethic. I think a lot of players who progress in poker get the same sort of feeling that if you put time and energy into something, uh, you'll get better. I know on your questionnaire, you said you believe that if you put talent and energy into something, that you can get better at it. So yeah, I think that's a, another strong thing that poker teaches you as a, a life sure. lesson. I think just to like caveat that one thing, like like I cycle a lot at the moment, but like at the moment, I would say like I've reached a level where like, like I'm a good good cyclist, but there's sort of a ceiling in, in sports that you get maybe that is not there in poker sometimes, or I haven't experienced so much in poker where like my level as a cyclist say, it's harder to progress now. Like it's harder to get that much faster. Like maybe I would see my friends get faster than me then. And I'd be like, oh, I'm putting all this time in, like I'm doing sort of the same stuff, but maybe like, maybe your body genetically isn't adapting to something. Maybe it's like something that you aren't doing right still. Um, but then being okay with that, like is also very important. Like, like just not everything is about getting to be the best or getting to, like, cause it offers a lot more than just, improvement like oh i just want to be faster or something like like certain stuff that maybe you put a lot of time into that you don't gain like improvement in is still very fulfilling to your life even though you're not getting specifically better at it so like cycling say for me is like like a time to like hang out with friends a time to be outside like in nature like experiencing a new place or something like that and sure like part of it is like you want to get better at it if you're not, it's still giving you all this stuff. So like, you don't need to focus too much on like, like, ah, oh, I didn't get better at this one thing. Like it, it's not, it's not good or something. I don't know if that makes sense. 100%, yeah. It's like the activity itself brings more than just being good at it. The, especially with cycling, like being outdoors, the health benefits, there's a, there's more to the puzzle than just like improving. Obviously one of the most, um, exciting parts about doing anything especially a sport is getting better at it over time and very often if you stagnate for a long period of time you generally get bored with that so fitness and progression but at the same time being realistic that it definitely in, in physical sports genetics play a bigger role i'm sure if i trained the perfectly for all my life i would never 
beat you in bold, 100 meter sprint, but he's in good shape. There's just sure. certain mm-hmm. things that you need to accept physically. And I know myself as a runner, I used to I train from the age of 13 to 23. And there's some guys who are really, really talented. Two of the guys in my training group went to the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And yes, I could make the excuse that I was using the, the talent kind of excuse that I just wasn't working hard yeah. enough. And the same like kind of phys- physical, their bodies was more designed to run at middle distance speeds quickly. And they responded better to training than me. And then yeah. those dynamics, maybe I could have, I closed that gap a little bit more but I was always up against it against certain people and I think you need to sometimes accept okay I'm not going to be the best uh, possible at this but then you've got your own quest and what I like about poker and sport is it's often you against you and you yeah. choose the game rules as long as you're like trying to beat yourself and get better whatever that means to you there's, some, there's an individual pursuit that only you really know in the moment I'm trying to do like a lot of weightlifting no one really cares what I do, but myself, I, I'm very particular in my logbooks and trying to get better. And for me, it's fun. Yeah. It's just a fun game of trying to get better yeah. in a variable. For you, cycling, I'm sure you've got a lot of cycling metrics that you're keeping track of right now. And for you, you'll, you'll be aware that, okay, these are getting better. And over time, that's very engaging. So I think having a pursuit, and I think often poker players, it'd be healthy for most players to have some pursuit out of poker, which has more controllable variables that you can pursue and get better at. And I think like what you talked about earlier in terms of learning curves was really interesting for me when you're talking about when you when you start something new you have a very fast learning curve almost in anything in the first 20 hours of learning something new you learn very very quickly then as you get to a good level you get a very very small increase for a large amount of time and that gets smaller and smaller and smaller it's called the the law of diminished returns in terms of improvements and for some people that's very demoralizing but for like high achievers that's actually really exciting and obviously you see a decimal move on something you're like yes that moved one little bit after like 20 hours of I really try. And so I think for someone like yourself who plays high stakes, I'm sure you get a lot of uh, kind of pleasure and satisfaction from the small improvements now. And that allows you to yeah. Uh, yeah, keep going. Yeah, definitely. All right. So I wanted to ask you of all the levels you try to crack into, I think I've got a rough idea based on what you've told so far, which of the stakes that you've currently managed to establish yourself at was the hardest to break into and why was it so challenging? Um, 5K yellow for sure. Like I'm still down like, maybe like 150k lifetime on that stake, I think. Like on six max specifically. Um, like I ran like a lot under EV, but just the game was just so much harder because you're playing versus like at that time, like every end boss in PLO was like, if you wanted to play in that or like open set, you had to like battle three handed with like better players basically. And like I sat and battled but they knocked me down for sure. Um, and like, I think actually half of the problem was initially I gained quite a lot of success. Like the first month of something of shooting like 5K, I think I made like like 130K or something. Um, so then like what you said about earlier, like evaluating your edge and stuff, like I would see them making mistakes when I won. And then when I started losing back and like not doing so well in that game, it was always maybe then like like a like a how do you say like a limiting belief where then like I thought I was better than I was against them I thought they were making more mistakes and maybe those mistakes just didn't count really in the grand scheme of things um so then like like I had quite a big downswing after that um where then I had to eventually move down to like two five and five ten again um from like sort of battling a, a lot of 5k in like 2019 that would have been um and and it was tough like sort of like getting to that 5k battling with these tough tough guys to then sort of going back and just grinding sort of like the like two five five ten games on party poker at that time um and like reevaluating your skill like realizing oh like after unfortunately after losing like a lot back realizing that like i wasn't playing that well even though i thought i was using the solvers to study I think it's then easy to make crutches in your own game where like, you're like, oh, yeah, I wasn't far off here, but you're actually taking that line. Like, like if it's like only a small error, but actually frequency wise, you're, you're doing it all the time and you're always in your head. Like, ah, oh, like I taken this line passive because of this, um, this reason, uh, but you don't realize like, okay, in that specific isolated spot, like it's not that big a mistake, but then you look at the whole game plan and like, you're just passive, 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 which was my problem at that time. Um, and in, in isolation, none of them were big mistakes. So I would go through the hand in the solver and be like, oh, I haven't done anything wrong. 
But then mm. as a whole game plan, it was just losing like little bits here and there. But it took a long time for me to realize mm. that. Like I lost a lot basically, mm. like just from that. And then like when you're running under EV, like, okay, like I probably wasn't losing much. It was close, but I wasn't, I wasn't beating them for sure. Mm. Um, and even if I was like, there, I was making a lot of mistakes that I didn't actually see at the time, even though I thought I was like being super dedicated. I was like, I was studying a lot and like trying to figure out how they're playing. But um, even then, like I had a mask over, over my play, I guess. Mm-hmm. It sounds like running good to begin with, with that sample size, create a lot of um, obstacles for you. And the mind got very biased towards your initial sample size, which happens very often. And you almost like labeled guys as bad and you were, you're beating them quite comfortably to begin with. And then all of a sudden yeah. you get anchored to that kind of, uh, kind of viewpoint almost that label it's the same like with the first mm-hmm. impression you meet somebody and you like them very often you like that person for a longer or if you hate somebody it's very hard to change that and as you were seeing more information coming back at you it took you a while before you started to go wait a second maybe it's my strategy that needs to improve and it's it takes a lot yeah. because you've got this confirmation bias that i'm beating these guys and like you said your your mind try to protect you by kind of marginalizing some of the mistakes so that you didn't have to deal with the fact that potentially these guys could be better and it's, it's really hard because you go from this one point to uh, the ego is very satisfied because you're winning and you're beating these guys. And now you need to go, wait a second, actually, I'm losing. They're beating me. And you need to go from like the dominance, I'm beating people to, wait a second, I need to learn. I need to get better. So it's like a humbling experience. And often like if you yeah run good for a period of time and have to reflect, there's a, it takes a bit of time for the mind to catch up. And yeah. sounds like for yourself, that, that was part, part of the case. Ironically at the time also, like I gained, like, like people wouldn't play me either at that time. But ironically, I was probably losing in some of the three-handed games, but players still wouldn't play. They'd be like, oh, no, like, don't want to play three-handed. But, like, like it's just kind of funny sometimes. Like, I was there probably the one losing, but in my head I was winning. But then, like, these players were probably beating me, and then they were like, no, we don't want to play, like, three-handed. And it's like, like, you're like, what was going through their heads? Like, they should have been grinding me out, like, taking me for everything. Um, but they maybe yeah. lacked that killer instinct. So, like, like okay, certain players would would carry on playing but like certain others for them would be like oh i'm not sure about this spot instead of actually playing and then like seeing they would maybe edge out of it and then maybe me at that time was i just had too much hubris but i didn't maybe even get punished enough for it because like the guys weren't they weren't fighting enough you know whereas in no limit if you had hubris like that i think you'd get pegged down like they wouldn't stop playing you like they'd be like this guy's doing the mistake yeah it's probably quite confusing for yourself as well because you're like, well, these guys must be worse than me. They're running away. They won't play me. Yeah, so you're, exactly. you're like trying to think, oh, what the hell? It, it's it's super like tough sometimes. In that. Like I think yeah. even now, like sometimes in a game, like I'm a dog, but like, 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 like I'll just play because I, like I just want to play. You know, like mm-hmm. you you want to try it. Like you want to you want to see what they're doing. Like and and have a challenge rather than just being like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm winning. Like I don't want to play at all. Like it's mm-hmm. just. It's a bit sad if the game gets like that. Yeah. So when you realized potentially you were losing in those games, how did you reapproach shooting those games and playing them in order to get better and establish yourself at that level? Um, I think like once I moved down, okay, like at that time, I wasn't playing very well compared to the best, best regs, but that losing helped me get better for when I was playing lower then. And like only then a small few changes, realizing that I was too passive in certain spots then made me very, very good at mid-stakes. And then, like, I progressed very, very quickly then back up to it. And then when I played it again, like, I, it just stuck then. But but it, it took that, like, moving down and then realizing also that, okay, like, I'm not better than these guys, but then it helped me get better than everyone else, even though I lost. Like, ideally, you wouldn't lose the money to then learn that mistake. But But, like, I think... That journey of losing a lot at 5k then helped me get back there and make it stick because i was like like i had had the success versus them a bit and i was like oh like i want to get to that spot again i want to then beat them like it, it's a goal to then to then get there and try and try and do better than them um, and i think that's that a very like drove me but then also like like when you go back down you realize how far you've come and maybe like oh then like these games feel a lot easier and then you you adapt a little bit and change a little bit because in the whole sense like you're not that far off you're just making the small mistakes everywhere maybe um, 
Yeah, that sounds like a very challenging experience to go through from a mindset perspective, because obviously you've, you've shot those higher stakes, got some good results, but then you've had to reevaluate and then drop down stakes and start battling at lower stakes to get your strategy up to speed, learn the lessons that you need to learn from the higher stakes. But for a lot of players, that's very challenging. Like in if you just ob objectively look at it and go, right, well, just go on stakes and play low and learn. But it's very hard because now all of a sudden you're like, your confidence has been knocked. You're thinking, am I good enough? Now you think there's a gap between where you are and where you want to be. You were grinding 5Ks a few months ago and now you're grinding 200 or 500 games. And all of a sudden it's like, oh shit, like I'm so far away from where I wanted to be. So um, are there any character traits that you feel like you have that allowed you to uh, see the situation for what it was that you just need to get better and learn, learn and shoot again? Do you feel like there's anything that's helped you to uh, uh, make that jump in, in the end? Yeah, I think initially there's definitely like some ego involved where like you're like, oh, I'm a 5k right now. And then you're like, oh, these players won't play me. I don't need to play 2 5 and 5 10 because like, like this is where you're at, but actually you're not there. And then also you think like, oh, what will these players think if you drop down? Like, oh, they're going to be like, oh, like he got smashed. He has to play these stakes again. Like, um, so then in your head, you're like, you're sort of, in a way like a little bit worried like what are the players are gonna like think about you because you're like back playing low and then you feel a bit like oh like i failed but i think very quickly then i was just like well this is where i have to be at the moment because like this is the bankroll this is like this is what i have to play this is my skill level and then you progress again from that so i think like it's very important to be adaptable like mm -hmm. like even if you have been at one stake in the past it doesn't mean you're like you're good enough to play there in the future but like like at the same time then then also like reevaluating and just being okay with like where you are in the journey and like like if it is that you're good enough to beat the mid stakes at the moment and like not good enough to beat the high stakes maybe you will try the high stakes and 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 try and beat it and like if it goes badly then then be okay with going back down like mm -hmm. and then trying to get there again or something like that Amazing advice. Really, really good. I, I like that. Trying to be adaptable. And it's easier said than done because like you said, the ego gets attached to playing a certain stake. And as you were kind of telling that story there, you were thinking about what other players at that level might be thinking of your decision to move down. It's really interesting as individuals, we, we put a lot of attention on what other people might perceive of us. When in reality, they're living their own lives, doing their own things. They've got their own reg battles going on. If you don't show up for a few months, they're probably not worried or thinking about it too much. But in our minds, we're like, oh, this guy thinks I'm weak now. He thinks I'm backing down. We create this whole narrative. When in reality, it's quite a simple situation where rebuild your role, the lower stakes, get better and, and try again if that's what you still want to pursue. So yeah, I like that adaptability and almost like not getting your identity too attached to the level you're playing because you might have to, you might be great at one part of your career, playing a certain level, but then the standard might get too good for you. You might have to move down and relearn the game to get back. So I think being that adaptable, flexible with your, your buy-ins and yeah, that's, Definitely a, a great lesson to, to kind of learn from poker, but also it's, it's challenging. I know for yourself, it sounds like you naturally were able to do that, where a lot of players who I've worked with have struggled when they've had a failed shot take and they've had to rebuild their role, especially like one or two levels lower than what they were shot taking because you've gone from living the dream, playing the stakes you want to, to now rebuilding and it's very humbling experience. So yeah, I think having that adaptability to be able to do that, to rebuild, because Poker's not linear. We're not going to be able to progress in even st stakes every time. And yeah, sometimes you've got to try and fail. It sounds like the 5K level for you was a, a big learning curve to, to figure out what you needed to do. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. All right. Last reflection question for me. If you could okay. go back in time and you could learn one lesson in advance that would speed up your journey to the current stakes that you're playing, is there anything that comes to mind that you feel like you, you had some hindsight on your, in your favor that would have sped up your journey to the stakes you're currently playing? Um, yeah, I think similar to the point that, that you, you mentioned just now, I guess, like where you have to be like a bit more adaptable and a bit more like honest in your, your, your own ability, but then like, like, I, I don't know. I think you also need to be like, you need to be willing to fight and like, just try and test yourself and not be like too scared to actually like play people because I think certain players are very very good but they're not like they're not putting themselves in games where maybe they would be because they're like oh like I don't want to play I don't want variance and it's like maybe their goals are different but if you want to get better like I think it's always important to try and challenge yourself and like going back to the point I made earlier about the no limit guys coming over to PLO like 
they just want to challenge themselves all the time and it, it's very inspiring like like it's cool to see because it, it's something that's lacking a bit in plo at the moment like um like the sort of guys that are just like they don't care maybe if they're losing maybe if they're winning they just want to like test themselves and, and learn by that 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 method i guess Mm. yeah i think it's quite afraid don't be afraid to like try and fail instead of not trying and then um not really knowing like if you could have achieved if you Mm. could have achieved that or not because a lot of players that are say very good but they're just at mid stakes or sort of 2k and they're like oh these players are better than me and in actual fact like i respect some of the mid stakes guys game more than the high stakes guys the guys that are playing like the 100k game but they're okay, like there's a big difference in role you need, but then they're also not putting themselves in a game that they're probably beating. Mm. Um, yeah. Great advice. Yeah, I think you say basically don't be afraid to fail and put yourself in challenging scenarios where you might be the underdog and mm. failure has a very strong likelihood. Like these non Holland guys coming to play some of the best PLO players, they just want to play and learn. And I think the main thing is, because it's quite a thin line, you've got to th- walk across where... You want to put yourself in games where obviously you can beat over the long term, but certain parts of your career, you want to actually challenge yourself and stretch, knowing that, wait a second, I'm the worst player at this table and I'm going to learn. So I think it's having the right intention of why you're going into these games. Obviously, every day you put yourself in tough lineups that you're the the fish, you're going to go abroad pretty quickly. But at the same time, you've got to go out of your comfort zone and take on challenges and be aware. I might fail at this this a lot. So uh, I think mid-stakes players listen to this. A lot of players will fall in that category where they're very good at their level. They've got really good win rates. But the thought of trying the next level and feeling it's pretty scary mm. so they'll tell themselves that the level above is really good these guys are amazing but they haven't actually tried they haven't actually built a sample yeah. size against these players so they don't really know so i think it's a, a good like kind of reminder to players who might be playing it safe to yeah. try and feel is part of the game and even the best players in the world put themselves in situations where maybe they're not the best player in those games so they can learn and, and get mm. better i think that's definitely true and like i think we do put certain players on the pedestal a lot where like like you're like, oh, this player's like super sick. He's so GDO and like this and that. And it's like, maybe you actually play them and you realize, oh, they're actually making mistakes here, here and everywhere. And you're like, oh, they're not that good. But they almost get promoted higher because of everyone just being scared of them. They get in this aura. And then it's like, like I think Doug, like Doug Polk talked about it years ago, like when he plays Source or something, like Source was just playing stupidly versus him. And like Doug in the end, like worked out how he played and crushed him. But but like Source had this aura about him that like he was like amazing. And then like like you don't know until you try and like certain players, like like me and my friends like definitely found the same. We're like, oh this player's meant to be super good, but he's making actually a lot of mistakes that are like fundamental. And then you're like like it, it's it's inspiring because then you're like oh there's room for everyone to to actually get there because no one is actually playing that well still. Like, mm-hmm. if you look through hands that I play, like, I'm making mistakes all the time, you know? Like, mm-hmm. like it is what it is. But, but, like, people get put too high on a pedestal and everyone's sort of too afraid to then, like, poke it a bit instead mm-hmm. of just poking it and then see, like, see what happens, you know? Yeah. Um, it reminds me of what, like, our podcast guest, Yuri Peleg, who said, everyone's a fish. No matter what game you're going to, everyone's a fish to some degree, basically trying to mean everyone makes mistakes and don't put anyone on a pedestal that you think they're unbeatable. There's some amazing player that all, they've all got leaks that you can attack. And yeah, like I said, like a lot of players will not move up stakes, especially as you get to a certain level in the cash games where the players are almost like celebrities in terms of they've been around for five, 10 years and everyone knows their names. Yeah. You've watched them for a long time. There's got this aura around them where you just assume they're amazing. I can picture my former heads of sitting goes, the 1k level we had like 10 regulars at that level who didn't play another regular for about a year and all the other mm-hmm. levels were just carnage it's just reg wars non-stop but yeah. these guys were on this pedestal going up oh, don't touch those guys they're 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 unbelievable they'll just beat everyone but, but they, they haven't someone... practiced for a year but... exactly exactly and all of a sudden we started scratching heads going they haven't played a reg in a year and the game's advanced a lot so a few brave people started prodding them and go wait a second this guy's not that good and all of a sudden you're like ah these are just normal players obviously they're rusty because they haven't played good regulars and yeah there's no uh, there's no like kind of geniuses that have just have solved the game and they just can't be beat everyone's a human you've got leaks in their game and obviously the game's evolving so if you're not battling every day you're probably not going to be as good so yeah i think it's a good reminder to, to not put the people on a pedestal but at the same time you don't want to be delusional you don't want to like think you're some unbelievable player yeah. beat any player there's a level of humility that needs to come with that but at the same time like i said prodding the, 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 the analogy of prodding somebody to uh go right is he good let's build a sample and just see where, where i'm at 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Renny, for yourself, have you had to uh, battle this issue yourself where you had to uh, almost like force yourself to move up a stake where you're maybe a bit resistant? I know you've got to play some of the, the online goats of the game back in your, when you were playing. So do you feel like any of those levels of players were intimidating to, to, to prod, so to speak? Yeah, for sure. And I think it, it, I, was, I was reflecting on that. And I think a big leak throughout my career, and I would say still up until today, I think it's, it's, it's more of a mental game error. Like how much weight and meaning you give to losing. I think you, you talked about how much your identity is attached to losing. The more your identity is attached to losing, the more you're going to try to play it safe. And I think a lot of players, they, they find reasons why they're not yet ready to move up. You know, they might have a great win rate. And when they have four BB, they say, no, but I need six BB. And when they have six BB, they mm. will find another reason why they're not ready, right? And then yeah. the other players who take the pokes, they find reasons why they are ready. It's just a matter of perspective, mm. right? It's do you highlight the leaks of your opponents mm. that are playing higher stakes or are you going to highlight the, the better spots of your opponents yeah. playing higher stakes? There's, there's one player like actually that did sort of make quite a cool progression. Um, he's called Tabebe on Stars like um um at the start of the year like he basically ran up from like sort of i think he was mainly grinding like one two and two five zoom and he ran up to basically just fighting everyone and got up to like 5k um and like i played a lot with him and like inadvertently i did okay versus him but but that sort of just swedish like never die attitude like he was fighting like it didn't matter if it was i'm so good or gravy and like suddenly like certain players weren't playing him even though like like he just moved up you know and like like it's like he just wanted a game um and it was quite interesting to see like like this guy that just wanted to fight and like wanted to uh like just test himself against everyone and no matter who it was like he would try and like like i think sometimes even like i'm so good was quitting him because he was just like running him over basically with like an an orthodox style um and like like it was quite inspiring to see that like someone sort of progress up the stakes again in in heads up plo with that sort of attitude yeah and he had that right he had that mentality right i think also something that you mentioned is to realize i think it was when i asked you about you playing ring games you said yeah i make a lot of mistakes but so does everyone else Right, mm. so you, so you're focused more in terms of your relative skill compared to your opponents, and realize that everyone is human, that everyone tries to make mistakes. I think another important one is also your need for certainty. I think I always had and still have a quite a high need for certainty before I jump in that I actually beat the games. So let's say, for example, uh, there was a guy coming over from another game or a bit of an unknown type of player who suddenly started to battle. I would usually be the first one actually to jump out of the game and sort of watch mm. it from the sideline first. And then I first had to see him do various things wrong. And then I would jump in. Now, on one side, that did prevent me from having big downswings or playing in games that I wasn't beating. But on the other side, mm. I missed a lot of volume uh, uh, yeah. versus in games that I most probably in the end I would have made way more money if I would have, mm. you know, jumped over that and, and tried at least. But yeah, I just yeah. had too high of a need for certainty, which I think is attached to uh, being afraid to lose because losing means that not only you lost your game, but you take it like as I'm a loser or I'm not good yeah. enough. And especially if you have it's like, like if you don't try, you don't lose, but then it's like... Exactly. So, so I, I think the more the more afraid you are of losing due to, for example, certain trauma that you have because in the past, you know, you were labeled not good enough and that comes up again if you lose, the, the more you're going to try to prevent losing. And I think I personally really relate to that, uh, that you're then going to tr try to do everything within your control in order to not lose. Now, that resulted for me in a very high win rate, but the volume obviously way lower because I would only mm -hmm. play if I would feel my best. I would only play if I was very certain. I would only play versus a guy who I've studied the whole day. <laughs> you know, so, so I want I wanted to kind of predict the future so that I wouldn't yeah. get into spots where I didn't know what to do or didn't know what mm -hmm. to expect. But obviously the flaw in that is it's way more about embracing the fact that you could screw up. It's embracing the fact and accepting mm -hmm. reality that you could be losing. It's accepting the fact that you will get into spots where you don't know what to do and kind of not seeing that as a threat, but more 
as an opportunity like these guys probably do. Like, yeah, okay, uh, best case scenario, I win. Worst case scenario, they confront me in a part of my game that I'm not very really good at, that I have to improve in order mm -hmm. to progress. So they, their mentality kind of make that shot a sort of win-win situation, if you get yeah. what I mean. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, going back... Or going back, no. Going to present moment. I'm curious. Okay. Going forward, Griffin, what are your uh, what are your goals in poker? What are you trying to still achieve? Um, I think now, like just trying to, I guess, get better at six max. Um, if that's going to be the game that's available to play on GG, like there's very big games to play there. Um, just try and progress on there. But then also, like, like, like I would like to just like maybe like play some more heads up versus some people. Um, but, but like, I, I would caveat that like the, like I mentioned off the podcast earlier, that like the progression is quite hard sometimes at like the stakes now where there's not much action and maybe the only action is like maybe off like one or two players and then like getting to the level above that is then hard because there's no games to then get better um or not to get better to to the, like increase your role to then play against like like someone at a higher stake um so i guess like the the goal has to be then inc increasing the role like either by getting a good game and heads up like at the stakes that i'm currently playing or like um progressing on the stakes on gg um because like yeah the games there are massive in terms of motivation, we talked about in the beginning, you saw a clear ladder, you know, ranking to move mm. up. Now you're at the top. What keeps you then driving? Do you do you notice that you have to fire yourself up a little bit more, maybe especially in ring games where your natural uh, competitiveness, your natural challenge get less triggered? How do you then go about keeping yourself motivated? Um, yeah, I think the heads up stuff motivates me a lot more. Um and then for ring games, just like being a bit more professional about it, being like, okay, like, like this is this is where you want to get to. Then you have to put in the time here, um, and like you have to just sort of take joy in the the other parts of it that maybe like is not super super what you want to be doing, but it's still like it's still fun, like it's still interesting. It's just in a different way than you used to. Um, and then so really going into that, and I think like I think maybe sometimes like like when you actually start getting into it and like actually being disciplined about it, you actually gain like a progression. Like you find the, the ways to progress after you start trying or say at the moment or like in the last few months at six max, like I wasn't trying so much to find that progression. But then once you actually like get your head down a bit, like then stuff opens up, the more you go into it, like the more windows open to then progress. Whereas if you're like half-heartedly doing something because you're focused on something else, maybe you don't see the, maybe I'm here like, oh, like there's no way to progress. Like this game is too big. This is like, there's no one to play. But actually that's that's an excuse, I think. Like like um, if you go down and look through the hands like that you played last session and then like 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 you, you quickly notice that you're playing far from perfect, like far from well and like, like you quickly realize like, oh, there's a lot of good games to play, but you're just not putting yourself in there. You've gone and done something else instead. Um, so I think like maybe for me, just being a bit more professional and playing a bit more at the moment would be also good. So it sounds like it's not necessarily the game you play. It's more the approach to the game that you play that determines how motivated you are. If you're actually in that game, not going through the motions, but actually looking to improve, that kind of sparks that challenge in you and that makes you more motivated. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. If it's you like, you just have to put yourself in there first and like be professional in that approach when you start to then try and improve or something. What would be your uh, biggest threat going going forward in these ring games that you would have to be um, aware of? I are mean, you gonna maybe be too, I'm just are, are you are you going to be too like, passive? Uh, I don't know. Like maybe I'm just making mistakes. Like like the the game on gg is very high rate so you have to be careful about be pipping in certain spots um and like like it's definitely a bit sad like not to moan on that but like like in the game that is so so volatile to the rake and like your pvi or something like like you do have to be more careful in selecting on a game like that um 
but say like on ACR, like the, the games there are not very, very, they're very, very low rate. Um, but there's maybe a bit less of them, I guess then. Um, but then also just dealing with that, like that circumstance and then also being realistic in like certain ones where maybe you're not winning. If there's like everyone's 20 big blinds deep and you're paying like 14 big blinds per hundred, probably not the best game either. Um, and being realistic in your edge in that spot as well. All right, so those are a couple of things to 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 look out for. I'm sure you 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 mentioned right. You you have some friends around you that can help you. I think this has been a theme throughout all the players that we've had on. Everyone works together with certain other players. They can they can hold you accountable. They can point you out on certain leaks that might slip into your game. Um, I think my last like just mm-hmm. on that point. Sorry, just on that point. I think it is kind of cool. Like uh, with poker, like it is in general quite an isolated thing where you don't want to give like me coming on here now is giving information to competitors right but just the fun aspect of that like like when it's like your little group versus someone else's little group versus someone else's little group and each of them are doing stuff better than us and worse than us like they're doing some stuff very well like i don't know like finnish group playing or like like some norwegian group of guys playing like canadian group like like a of high stakes regs like they're doing certain stuff better than our group but they're also doing certain stuff worse and it's kind of fun like like all the differences and the different approaches with like different groups of friends and then like the different regulars involved in that group then how they're playing compared to the other people and like like probably a lot to learn from each other but we never actually talk to each other about the game because we don't want to give away our stuff to them or something like that but i just it's kind of cool though yeah, it's a very interesting dynamic that you are sort of enemies, but in the same time, also in in like for example, if you want to meet up with people who are mm. like at your level, sort of, it's also the people who you have most in common with in terms of building for friendships, sure. for example, right? Mm. So the, your enemies are sort of also your friends in the same time, right? Yeah. Let's say for example, you are you're a professional boxer at the top. Uh, yeah, there's not a lot of professional boxers who are, who are also at the top, so automatically you're gonna be hanging out with the guys who are also at that level, right? So it's mm-hmm. it's very interesting in these type of sport environments uh, that this can happen. Um, one of my last questions for you that I have is, you know, you're 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 trying to um, uh, get better in these ring games. You would pr- like to have some uh, more heads up action. What is what is like the end goal in terms of how what what is like your definition of success right that's in the end what we all strive for in in your definition what would be success in the end um like it's a good question because sometimes like if you ever look like progressing from poker like like at what point do you then stop um like my dad even asked this recently like like he was like oh like like we never questioned it after university like you've gone and done your own thing and but like um like when are you going to do something different like do you want to do something different do you want to carry on like doing this at the moment i guess i still find a lot of pleasure in working out stuff that i'm doing wrong and like progressing like that we're like there's the certain drive that like it's interesting you know there's still challenge involved in it but say if like in six months time there's no games or like it's very sporadic and like it's only a ring game here and there like maybe at that point like you would then get less motivated to carry on playing the game um but at this point like there's still a lot of action like for for ring games or something there's still progression to be made there's still a lot of areas in your game that you're making mistakes so it's kind of nothing's really changed in that aspect it's just you have to like change what you're doing like what games you're playing a little bit but the the same the same challenges are still there i guess so for me it's still fun because you're still finding stuff out um but I guess like it, I guess it's not so much due to down to success, like is when I would stop or like what I would define as success is when that like drive to carry on playing goes is when I would also play a little less or stop. When the pleasure kind of fades away, would you maybe also, I think what is the most growing market now in poker? I would say no limit hold'em tournaments is probably the most Mm. growing 
in environment currently in poker would maybe switching a game at some point or i don't know mix i i have no clue about the mixed game environment mm. or other type of games would that be something that you could find pleasure and interest in i mean i guess starting sort of from zero in a new game does offer offer a lot of these big learn curve opportunities again for yeah. you yeah i think probably at this stage after playing poker for so long maybe i would not go into that um because also like i value a lot like lifestyle and stuff and like tournaments are just not really something that like i could see myself doing maybe like a few live slots or something um i think it definitely would be super interesting to get into but like at this time like having played poker for so long maybe like i would be less interested in doing in doing that um anything else that currently like a, a uh, currently interested you um into crypto so or something because, like crypto is just like something you withdraw into i guess but not really <laughs> something that i actively do mm -hmm. um or like 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 take a huge amount of interest in the moment just mm -hmm. because like i think for anything that i like to do well it requires a lot of headspace and if you're into crypto and like like if you think about it if you have to be like if you want to make a living on it or something or like you want to like trade it i don't know what like what people are doing but like i feel like you have to kind of be all in on that um and then doing it also while trying to be very good at poker is quite hard i don't i don't know how some people like juggle being very good at like a lot of different stuff because this is already a lot for me um yeah like, i like i, I feel say linus there. like being very good at ELO or like very sweet going over to no limit like crushing everyone there like being like oh anyone can play me at plo and like 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 it's impressive right um i mean i i i haven't played any plo i don't you mm -hmm. probably recently haven't played any no limit Hold on, but i guess there's a very big overlap in terms of mechanics in terms of how to learn the game how the game works like the fundamental rules about yeah. you know equity distributions equity realization denial etc i think the the broad concepts would still apply yeah. so i i would say you probably learn fast if i'm not mistaken maybe, yeah. maybe. Yeah. so so maybe maybe cash games heads up cash games that could be something that you could transition to at some point as well mm. uh, we'll see I think I think probably not, but yeah. Unless someone asks for like half and half, maybe, and it would have to be like, I think the the no limit guys p play PLO a lot better than we would play no limit at the moment. So. Uh, all right. Yeah, that yeah. that doesn't seem fair in that case. It, no. This is gonna be all for me. Do you have any last words that you would like to add, or something that you would like to educate our listeners on, or any final words? Um. Just that maybe like some other PLO players would like to come on the podcast. Would be cool to listen to other people's stories. Um, yeah, I don't know. Thanks for having me, I guess. Like I was Adam? initially quite like, mm -hmm. uh, oh, I'll just say it anyway. Like I was initially quite hesitant to come on. Um, but like, like um, I think I watched like just before coming on this one, I rewatched like a, another one of your podcasts maybe. And like just like hearing, I think, maybe it was Stefan or something and just hearing him say like talk about like oh like the enjoyment he gets from just talking to other poker players and like hearing their different inputs and outputs um just in life in general is always like quite fulfilling so it's good to have a conversation with you guys about poker um and like maybe someone else will as well come on and do some more yeah and if you like to listen to play i think this is also something that you mentioned you like to listen to guys coming on podcasts but if everyone says no, there's no one to listen to, right? Sure. Like, um, like a lot of the podcasts nowadays are like a lot of coaches say that are trying to like sell a course. Like I'm not trying to sell anything. Like, like, like I'm just a poker player, I guess. Um, and there's a different perspective maybe there that like you wouldn't get from someone who's like trying to sell a course, but then at the same time, like we're a lot less incentivized to come on and do a podcast. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's always good for him. All right. So this is a call out to all the high stakes poker players who have declined my invitation to come on the podcast. <laughs> Re reflection <laughs> reflection moment. Adam, do you have any uh, final questions or words that you would like to add before we let Griffith go? 
I think we've come to a great closing point. I did have a few questions lined up, but I think they would take us on to a part two of the podcast. So I'll leave those maybe for a round two. But yeah, thank you very much, Griffith, for your time. It's been a great having you as a guest. And yeah, I'm sure our audience are going to love all the insights you've shared. Okay, thanks very much. Another great episode in the books. Thank you, Griffin, for sharing all this knowledge with us and the audience. It was a great conversation. Adam, your main takeaways from today's episode? One of the things I liked about his story was not being afraid to take on challenges and to put yourself in environments where you might be the underdog, but you can learn from it. I think throughout his career, he's shown that putting himself in tough lineups so you can learn and get better has been very advantageous for his career. Yes, it's points he overdid that and maybe played himself in tough games when he should have potentially moved down quicker. But overall, being able to uh, take on challenges and not be scared to to fail is a huge, huge uh, skill set that he's developed or that he's always had throughout his career. I can imagine today he gets a message from Linus and says he wants to play. He's the kind of guy who says, yes, let's play in a lot of games where a lot of people would just be intimidated and maybe overthink, should I, should I play? Should I not? Can he beat me? He's somebody who jumps into challenging environments and that allows him to learn a lot quicker. Alongside that, in order for that to be effective for him, he mentioned him being very adaptable and having adaptability, which allows him to move up stakes and down stakes without too much of negative consequence. So, for example, let's say he's playing one case and he should shot six five case. If he loses X amount of buy-ins, he's someone who can take the lessons from that, go back to the lower stakes, rebuild his role, and then shot take that again. So there's adaptability to uh, not get too attached to the levels you're playing so that you can fluidly move between buy-ins, take opportunities as they arise and challenges as they come up, but at the same time, also be able to move back and rebuild without the ego getting too involved. So yeah, those are some of the, the main ones that I thought were really, really powerful. And yeah, I think that's allowed him to uh, play the stakes he currently does today. How about yourself, Rene? What are the main things that you took from that conversation? Yeah, to continue on that point that he mentioned about when he took the, the 5K shot, and he also mentioned, like, it's not now that you're there, you know? Like, what I wrote down as a note is, like, permanence is a delusion. It's not like you are now going to be there forever. There's hungry people trying to take your place. And also what you mentioned about the moving down, he was very... Um, there was not a lot of emotion attached to the fact that he had to move down so he could see reality as was. He, I think he said like, yeah, your bankroll is now X, so you can no longer play this stake. And there was no ego or emotion around it. So seeing reality as is and acting accordingly uh, and not get it, let it have been blurred by emotions or the ego, I think is a very important skill. Um, indeed, also, the, uh, also for other people, I think this has been a repeating thing as well throughout a lot of players. Um, the conversation that we had with a lot of players that they say a very big problem that a lot of players have is they don't move up, even though they might already be ready, but they find reasons that they're not ready. So this is just a returning thing that I noticed in a lot of our conversations. So if you struggle with that, probably there's a good chance that you have too big of a fear of losing. There's basically too much on the line. So it's good to do some work around that. Like what are your, uh, I think you mentioned it, Adam, the ident if your identity is too, too much linked with your results in poker, then you might want to play it safe. So definitely some work you can do around in that area. In terms of technical, uh, I asked him at some point, what would a coaching session look like if he would uh, have to coach someone? And he talked about studying the most frequent spots. I think this is, uh, this is actually the same philosophy that I used in my CFP. Uh, when I was coaching people, we took it spot by spot and we started with the most frequent one and ended with the less frequent one because some people are intrigued by studying the less frequent spots because they don't know what to do there. However, in my opinion, if you study the most frequent spots, nil those, you will actually play better. Your confidence is higher. And then you actually be able to figure out less frequent spots as you go because you're in a higher confidence state because in a loss, but you do know what to do. Um, another thing that always comes back and I think he even mentioned like, oh, you have the Norwegian group, you have the Finnish group. Nowadays, and especially in high six poker, you're not playing against individuals anymore. You're playing against small groups of players. So if you're listening or doing it by yourself, you should go find a group to study with, to, to talk strategy with, to improve with, because no one at the top does it alone. Okay. And if you are maybe looking for a good community, Mechanics of Poker 2.0 comes with a great Discord community. Free lunch, go over to mechanicsofpoker.com, put your name on the priority list, and maybe we will pick you 
to join the pre-launch for the Mechanics of Poker 2.0. I want to thank everyone for listening. I want to thank my co-host Adam for providing us with his summaries and his wisdom as always. If you like this podcast, leave some main takeaways down below in the comments. Rate us five stars, follow us, etc., etc. And I will see you guys in the next episode.